We are live. Uh, so uh, I think I can officially thank everyone for being here. Uh, it is a it is a pleasure to hear you all. I think it's uh, it's an honor to uh, have we have you discussing uh, the book and having us. You know, it's a pleasure to have us discussing it and talking about it. So uh, yeah, so. Um, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hope you have a good uh, time discussing this. And uh, I'm very happy, of course, that uh, the book is being uh, has provoked uh, very interesting reactions um, about which we're going to be uh, talking. Um, so uh, basically, in this first session, we're going to have uh, Carlos and, and Sofia, um, and, uh, and then we're going to have uh, Chris, uh, sorry, and then we're going to have Paul, and then we're going to have Jason. Um, and then we're going to have a break, and then we move to the second session with uh, more attractions. So um, if everyone is happy, I think we can move directly to the first <coughs> speakers. That be all right. That be all right. Well, so, that's, so, so, that's, uh, yes. yes. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Um, thanks very much for having us. Yeah, you should have. I muted the room. No, you should turn off. Turn off the, the volume. The volume. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we 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 have We're our computers too close. So so. Okay. Now, good. So many thanks. Sorry. No, many thanks for having us join this uh, meeting. We are delighted to be part of it, although we are a little bit overwhelmed as well to be opening this first session. But there we go. Let's see. Um, in a time in which Hegel announces his return on behalf of the new functionalism that views today's production of knowledge as the ultimate and triumphal expression of a universal geist, it is tempting to read. Ilan's Ben Susan's indexicalism against the backdrop of Schelling's tacit criticism of Hegel, according to which it is not history that has a reason, but reason, read, thought, that has a history. What we mean by this should not be very difficult to guess. Uh, no, not this one, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm checking whether, yes. You, you can see all this light. Does it display properly? Yeah, the first one, good. Um, Western thought exhibits four partly diachronic, partly synchronic and interfering logical architectures, chiastic, demonstrative, illuminative, and subtractive. Heraclitus fragments, Plato's hypothesis on the Aide, and structuralism are examples of the former type whose savage or extra modern qualities are anything but casual. Whereas Aristotle's proto-modern and many times adapted deductive mode of reasoning is the earliest illustration we have of the second type. Christian mysticism and Nietzsche's will to power, which turn around different yet similarly irradiating intuitions reflect the third type and both Heidegger's crossed out being and most of today's postmodern philosophical drifts from deconstructionism to object-oriented ontology display the latter type in antithesis to the second one. Now, does not Ben Susan's indexicalism stand at the crossroads of two of these logical architectures, namely the subtractive and the chiastic? and hence between the all too common today and the otherwise. For Ben Susan's indexicalism aims at exploring the great outdoors opened up by a speculative realism in a non-substantivist manner, but it does so in an attempt to depart from the modern ontologies project viewed as the 
fraction of what is common, repeatable, and intelligible, the disruptive alterity of any factual or potential other. Therefore, Ben Susan's indexicalism oscillates, in our view, between withdrawal and positiveness, or rather, it inscribes the tension between two distinct conceptual poles, the non-correlationist withdrawal of reality, which can be indexically mapped, but not thematized, and the acknowledgement of the positiveness of the otherwise. Or again, it moves halfway between subtraction and chiasmus, for if the other, any other, can be infinitely approached, but cannot be exactly known by me, I, in turn, am, positionally speaking at least, that other's other, with which Ben Susan brings together Levinas, the other is what I myself am not, and the Amerindian Nibel Cogito. I am, that which I am not is not. Now this bidirectional cannibal formula echoes Levi-Strauss's notion of structural difference as dynamic disequilibrium, which no less than the two labyrinths of Borges's two kings in the Aleph has nothing to do with Hegel's idea of totality. Place, sorry, palace and desert do not form one thing and their opposition cannot be synthesized in any possible way. Thus, ultimately, Ben Susan's indexicalism turns around the difference between here and there. These and that. We, me, sorry, and all it cannot the objection raised by him against Meliasu in being up for grabs, namely that necessity may be, uh, sorry, that contingency may be necessary but not sufficient. Can that objection not be raised now against Ben Susan's own absolutization of the indexical domain? Like ours, the conceptual worlds of those extra moderns about whom he writes in dialogue with Viveiros de Castro and Valentin present something more than the ictics. That is, their meaning elicitation and its reversed effect, cultural invention, transcends perception and opens up a possible world made of myths, rituals, and a number of other both substantive and non-substantive things. Among the non-substantive ones, for instance, enemies and affines. Amongst the substantive ones, matrilineality. Therefore, it transcends perception and opens up possible worlds which seem to us to exceed Ben Susan's neo-empiricism. And even if the purely dynamic or indexical power of transformation or rewilding of the given that your name and your shadow signal must remain unassignable, which is what Derrida fails to see in his critique of Levi-Strauss's encounter with an Ambiquara, its existence does not compromise any world at substantiality. Let us share a second slide. This one. No. This one. Recursive metaphorization is a great example, actually, of the extra modern preference for the symbolic over the rawness of the real and for noun play over the ictics. The shamans dislike those words that point at things too closely. So, as per the example displayed in this slide, they would see prolonged pain, but would not name it. They will, would visualize it as per uh, both perceptual and conceptual analogy as a river. And finally would say anaconda. In other words then, subtraction is a postmodern and hence perhaps an all too modern rather than extra modern passion. In the same way that a cosmopolitical forest with primordial otherness 
but no myths, is a postmodern landscape, like a philosophy forgetful that she is a continuation of Homer's dactylic hexameter by other means, or Pasolini's theorema, with Paolo running naked through the wilderness out of shame, but without Emilia willing to regenerate the earth with her tears. Unless, of course, one posits as spurious any difference between Paolo, Pasolini's Paolo in theorema, and the Hopi chief who told Moss, Je peux courir ainsi parce que je n'arrête pas de chanter mon chant du feu. Interestingly, among the Dani of Papua and New Guinea, what we would call the soul or any other similar term is called seeds of singing, from which it might be deduced that the problem with Pasolini's Paolo, who is able to break off with the bourgeois order, but incapable to replace it with anything else, is that he lacks a soul. He shouts, but does not sing. Still, Ben Susan ventures himself beyond subtraction insofar as the encounter with the other as such, that is to say, as a non-reducible other, leads him back to the same redefined, repositioned as receptivity. Indexicalism is thus crowned by a chiasmus, the postmodern folded onto the extra modern. And this is a promising move, one that does not overtly question and determination the modern malaise, but one that nonetheless succeeds in thinking something more than just anything, no matter how. And with it, the idea put forward in Ben Susan's former book, Being Up for Grabs, games in our view, both beauty and magic. An opposition can be understood as composed of a border that distinguish, distinguishes what is inside it and what is outside it, writes Ben Suzanne, evoking Leibniz. Were it not for this difference, indexicality itself would hardly be possible, as everything would disappear in the purely external night in which, as Hegel feared, all cows would be black. Yet Leibniz's take on interiority is not substantive, composed of their relations and ends they participate in. Leibniz's monads are individuated with the help of others and therefore relate as interdependent units of action. All this is fine as regards Leibniz's metaphysics, which Ben Suzanne reworks creatively. But could not Leibniz's epistemological approximationism be turned against Ben Suzanne's triangulation of perceptual approximation plus cognitive apartness versus the false prerogative of cognitive transparency? Does not Ben Suzanne fall here? Into the trap of what Seves calls the Cartesian, the Cartesian law of everything or not must be declared unknowable, consequently, as being always already situated between the general and the particular, the familiar and the otherwise. Amerindians regard knowledge in the same manner, as no matter how much room you may be willing to make for ontological and predictability, especially if you're a shaman and contextual or deictic referentiality, what is a prey or a person always depends on someone's perspective, you cannot survive in the rainforest if you do not know that the sound you're perceiving right behind you is the roar of a jaguar instead of that of a, of a caiman. Put differently, for them the question what is X, call it science tragic if you dare, is anything but dispensable. There is no true situatedness at the expense of it. Conversely, we have made such question dispensable because we are traumatized by the ontological fixity we have imposed on all others we have encountered. And so we prefer not to choose and not to say what things are. Hence the Ridas motto, nous ne choisirons pas. Yet this ontological epoche is unnecessary to care for the other as another. For please reread Anaximander and his Homeric subtext carefully. Ontology, but 
presented ethical concerns from the start, and thesis and as being by say Heidegger does not lead straightforwardly to the Morgenstern. Please read attentively Heraclitus's fragment B 123. In fact, the Greeks, like most other pre and extra modern peoples, were so intrigued by the otherwise, in spite of living in a world made of ontological determinations, which allowed them to care for, for things as justice, as justice stands in direct proportion to knowledge, that they dedicated the sanctuary to a God unknown. The contention, therefore, that ethics begins there where ontology ends is less logical statement than a cultural position. This Levinas's secures do no longer feel at ease with monotonism. Paraphrasing Lacan's suspicion about the modern death of God, we, do, we don't want the God of monotheism to become unconscious under the pretext that we have killed him. Much like that God, Ben Susan's other is like a stranger who does not come fully out of the mist and whose figure is barely seen, but with whom one must interact, asking oneself how to relate with it. Is it a subject without predicates, as it eludes any attribution of being, or is it a collection of nearly indexical predicates without a subject, like the Deleuze's black and white nothingness, respectively? Or is it a border in itself, as Garcia fancies? One does not finally know. One can only pluck it as if it were a non-ontological daisy. For, every, for even if it is close enough to be pointed at and minimal phenom phenomenical traits are bestowed on it, it eludes thematization. In other words, Ben Suzanne doesn't count knowledge among the technologies of contact that might help us interact with it, except in a few brilliant pages on Whitehead's concepts that open up an interesting line of inquiry may be insufficiently explored. As if we did not consist in picturing facts of ourselves, rather than thermosensing, like thermosensing our surroundings, like von, uh, like uh, von Uxkul stick, as if perception and knowledge did not go hand in hand for us as if knowledge were not what makes us capable of assuming other perspectives, as if it were not the guarantee of the transcendence that Ben Susan sings seeks beyond imminence, as if concepts were more a danger than an aid to us in our mapping of reality. One, one wonders, should we discourage their use because, we, because some have been misguided by their inevitable dose of sameness, as Averroes ironically suggested, those willing to prohibit wine should do with water, given them that some have drowned in it. This may just be another symptom of our modern malaise. If the Yanomani fear that which makes their heads spin, the Guarani fear the lack of repetition, the Che fear the shifting face of the world and distortion, and the Paracana only relate with those others whom they perceive to be at an optimal distance between the identical same and the indifferent other, lest their, their alterity become inapprehensible, that is ontologically and cognitively inaccessible, we, in contrast, are, ter are terrified before anything to define. We stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Should put the sound on. Yeah. So people are. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. yeah. You see? You have it there. Right on. Ah, because they don't have sound. Okay. You put the sound off. I put it up. I put it up. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. I think people can hear me now. Yeah. We're okay. having. Uh, slides, uh, slides uh, from sound, sound, but that's fine. Yeah, I can't
part of the part process. Of the, now, now I think, I think there, there is, is an echo. echo. Um, I don't know where it comes from. from. Um, um, anyway, anyway, so, uh, so uh, thank you very much. I'm also the chair here. Chair here. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so anybody so wants anybody to wants be, a to chair be a chair for a moment, for a moment try to sort out my sound, sound my problem? Sound. The sound is terrible. I can't. I can't hear you, Ilan. From here, may, maybe if you, they cannot hear you. Maybe talk, talk. Can, can you distort, hear me? It's distorted. It I don't know about the rest. There's a delay. How about, it seems, how about our seems, microphone? Is the signal feed, better? Yeah, it's a feedback between the yeah what you receive. We are receiving back again with a delay. So you have this supernatural voice with a big, huge delay. So <laughs> comprehension is uh, difficult now. <laughs> okay, what should we do? Um, what about if I if I say if now, I say yeah, something? Yeah, now it's good. That's good. Listen, you, you are muted in, in, in the Zoom. I see the sign of muted, right? But I can hear you nevertheless. So it's obvious that you have two different sound sources going on. So you have to turn one of them off. Uh, your, your source is our computer. Your source now, is our okay? computer, yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Uh, there's an echo. That's good. Andrea good. says it's difficult to understand. Sophia, Carlos, any. Uh, what about now? Now's good. Yeah, good. Right. <laughs> I can hear an echo, but it's just me. Okay, all right. So thank you very much to, to Carlos and Sophia for this first thing. And uh, I don't know, I have like uh, things to things to say, but uh, maybe maybe somebody else wants to start, otherwise I'll start. There is an echo. Yes, because we need to turn it up. Yeah. Is it better now? Mm -hmm. No. Is it still there is an echo? It's, just an echo. I don't know what that's... it's coming from here, maybe. Yeah, it's coming from here. So if we do this. Now it's yeah. good. Now it's good. Oh, yeah, perfect. So we're going to do that. So my source is going to be your computer. Okay. And, uh, that's it. Because okay. we are in the same room, if you didn't realize. Uh, <laughs> Sophia, Carlos, and me, they're in front of me. And they they said all these terrible things about uh, about me just in front of them, <laughs> just that, facing me. That was the point of it. Yeah. And uh, anyways, we've been we've been talking a lot about uh, the problems with uh, with the book in the last uh, few days, and uh, and about the virtues of the book as well. And some of the yeah about the virtues the Carlos is saying, and uh, also I'm um, uh, I'm going to uh, respond to some of you. Uh, in the in the final session um, directly, so including them, uh, some of you I think I hope I hope to respond to all of you, but uh, I'm already working on those responses that I for, of the papers that I got beforehand. So uh, that includes theirs. So um, whenever this is the case, I'm going to try to say things that uh, won't spoil my response uh, on Friday, if that makes any sense. So um, basically, I don't know if anybody wants to, to jump in and say something, uh, please do. But uh, otherwise I'll start with uh, three things. Um, three uh, kind of um, uh, kind of rebutals to, to, to things that uh, you said in the paper. Uh, of course, uh, I think this diagnosis that I'm trying, been trying to understand in the last few days uh, of uh, being between the chiastic and the subtractive is very interesting. And uh, um, you see that I'm struggling to understand that uh, throughout the, the symposium. Uh, I suppose they mean it in a, in a, in a, as an interesting move. Uh, because I think they welcome this chiastic element that I'm not sure I can locate, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to do my best. Um, basically, the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, no matter what, what, what are the merits of what they call Jewish animism, uh, it is not a form of monotheism, and it's not committed to monotheism. 
Uh, I don't know what, uh, why, why would you think otherwise? Uh, I think the Jewish element that might strike the, your, your, your complaint or your diagnosis that uh, is a kind of uh, monotheism. The Jewish element here is only, you know, uh, the Levinasian element, which is quite important here, because I think in a sense, one way of understanding the, my way or a way to a position like a dexcalism is to understand and that uh, we start out with uh, some kind of um, animism or almost animist um, kind of preoccupations that uh, are in the vicinity of process philosophy. And then uh, we try to add a Levinasian element here. Um, um, Stevens, uh, Steven Shaviro, Stevens' uh, characterization in on Facebook yesterday was that uh, it was a speculative realist, the book is a speculative realist uh, account of or rereading of uh, Levinas, uh, which is, I think, fair enough. Uh, I would stress for the moment, the element that uh, uh, the, 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 the connection with the closeness between speculative realism and process philosophy. There are big differences, but I mean, uh, it is also, indexicalism for me is also uh, a, a kind of a rereading of Levinas in the context of a process philosophy. But what would happen if you uh, want to take Levinas seriously in a, in a process um, uh, oriented uh, context? Uh, I think this is one way of describing the book and uh, what I'm attempting to do and, and very close to the descriptions I give in the, in the book itself. Now, uh, so the Jewish thing, uh, is maybe a relation to uh, a transcendent element that uh, is not uh, is not strictly speaking uh, un unique. Yeah, even though I mean um, one could think of ordinance in many in in any specific situation, like uh, indexically, and then other could look like. Uh, is unique and therefore mono, but uh, I don't think there is much mono theism uh, apart from that. Uh, so I would I wouldn't uh, you know think that uh, it, it involves a commitment to to monotheism. Now uh, there are two other observations I wanted to do. Um, they uh, they are kind of connected together. Um, one of them has to do with uh, what uh, Sophia just read when she said uh, it is very important when you are in the forest to be able to distinguish a uh, jaguar from a caiman because if you don't do that, then that's that that could be the end of your of your forest trip. Um, and uh, I uh, I don't quite understand the bite of that because. Uh, First of all, of course, I mean, you are uh, facing an order, right? Uh, but that order is not in any sense uh, a stranger uh, in the mist or something like that. And why is that? Because uh, basically uh, that doesn't stop you from thematizing, from uh, thinking through what the order is. Of course, I mean, there, are, there is here a, a tension between uh, doing uh, this thematization or trying to uh, grasp what this other is and uh, the very fact that the other is an other. But uh, I think this tension is part, of the, is part of the issue and it even thematization even might help you recognize the other as other. Uh, even though uh, this thematization uh, itself uh, maybe wouldn't be enough for you to understand uh, the power of, uh, of the other if it hadn't been for a pool uh, that comes from, uh, you know, the very connection that you have to the other that is grounded in what Levinas calls uh, at some point, uh, metaphysical desire, and in other points, uh, obsession. Uh, 
but anyways, so thematization is not is not is not eliminated, uh, and knowledge is still there. Now, one very important thing to 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 say, I think, is that thematization can be done in indexical terms and ultimately, it's uh, it's in indexical terms that it is done. Uh, so, for instance, the difference between these two animals are differences that have to do with uh, indexicals. Uh, they have to do with capacities that they have with respect to me. So this kind of conditional reasoning, uh, I don't see why this conditional reasoning could be, could be admitted to, a, to an indexical way of, uh, of conceiving uh, the, the two different animals that could be in my surrounding. So uh, roughly speaking, I would say, um, uh, so uh, it's not it's not about uh, sort of dismissing knowledge, right? It's about um, understanding that uh, there is that knowledge is it's about an understanding of knowledge that takes uh, otherness or the outside or the outdoors as a pool uh, that is present there, uh, and uh, that means. Uh, basically to understand that there is a limit to what I'm doing that comes from the other and not, not only for my incapacity to reach the other as much as I would spontaneously would like to. So, um, so it, it's not, it, it's not a, a, an empty knowledge position, uh, but basically to summarize, it, it's a position that understands knowledge as having uh, to have a pool coming from the other, and that involves what Levinas would call passivity. And then I think, you know, I mean, I won't get much into this right now, but the idea is that uh, it's not a passivity that, uh, that is just imposed on me because I can't go any further. I can't, uh, I don't have to say the technical means to go further. So I have to accept my own limits. It's not about my own limits. It's about limits that come from outside. And uh, if knowledge and thematization is, uh, can be done, they can be done uh, in indexical terms. And I think this is, uh, this is something that might not be straightforward. And then, of course, I would accept that substantives are uh, useful to, you know, to, to make the calculations, as I would say, yeah, but uh, whatever. But, uh, but, but ultimately, uh, you're dealing with uh, things around you and you're relating to your surroundings. And even if you're doing that conditionally, uh, as we often do, uh, that's, that means exploring your surrounding, uh, your surroundings based on the position that you are. And, uh, and that is enough to kind of give you um, kind of the indexical, um, uh, the, uh, the indexical picture of, uh, of 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 what is around in that case of of the the, the, the animals in the forest, um, but anyways, this is just to you know to, to just just say basically I yeah first I don't think there is monotheism involved here uh, maybe you do have a, an argument that they couldn't understand uh, then. <clears throat> Second, uh, it's not really about no, no thematization or no knowledge. It's, it's not about that. It's about having uh, uh, another pole that makes sure that knowledge is, in a sense, constrained by uh, something that is not a product of my exercises of freedom. Um, so anyways, if, uh, if you want to, I don't know, say something sure. about that, yeah. or if anybody Sorry. wants to jump in, I don't know. I'm a very bad chair, as you can, as you can, as you can see, yeah? But, uh, but yeah, so. Yeah, we can say, you want. Yeah. Yeah. So a um, couple of things in respect to the two things that you've mentioned. So um, absolutely, we don't, we don't feel like uh, the book is uh, committed to monotheism. And I think this would certainly be um, a term that we would not use, right? We don't see that there is a commitment to monotheism. We just um, took your reference to a Jewish animism as a very interestingly symptomatic pointer to something that seems to be 
behind not only what you write, but also, of course, Levinas' inspiration. We had a chance to talk these, uh, these days that we've having the pleasure of having Ilan here with us about uh, Levinas, about, uh, about not only the philosophical part of Levinas's work, but also about the um, Talmudist uh, part of Levinas's work, which is certainly very, very important. Let's say that by monotheism, on the other hand, we understand a pointer to a series of problems, to a series of categories, to a series of concerns that in our view, and I think it is not uh, excessive to, to, to affirm this, are latent throughout the work of Levinas and somehow orientate uh, his thought. And the most important one for us, which certainly resurfaces, we think, in your book, is uh, the preference for ethics versus ontology. Uh, this is something that once and again comes out in, in your book. It is, of course, one of uh, Levinas' main, 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 main thesis. And uh, what we were willing to do is simply to point out that there is a moment in your writing in which the Jewish dependence on these becomes explicit. And it is when you use the um, uh, syntagm um, Jewish animism, right? So again, it's not that we perceive that the book is committed in any one possible, in any possible way to, to monotheism. It is that we seem to, we find some um, elements which are important from Judaism in both Levinas's thought and uh, therefore too in your thought, and um, especially in connection to the problem of the relation between ethics and ontology, and ontology. And in particular, we find that you acknowledge that somehow explicitly, if obliquely at the same time, whenever you use this composite notion of uh, Jewish animism, right? About uh, thematization and, and um, the second point that you've made. Undoubtedly, we think that uh, that uh, the the book is is immensely rich in opening uh, perspectives of what you call um, technologies of approximation, right? And in fact, there is I think that Sophia has mentioned these pages that you dedicate to the role of concepts in in Whitehead, which which are really extremely inspiring, right? But um, and we also understand if we've understood correctly your your position that, that there is um, a certain stressing of the value that indexicals have um, in the access, right, to otherness and in the dealing with otherness and uh, a certain departure from um, the over uh, emphasizing of substantives in this, in this sense. That is to say, we understand that there is a sort of, if you want to put it in these terms, a sort of polemical take, right, v versus substantivism. And, and we are very fine with that. I mean, um, restoring the value of indexicals is certainly very important, right? But where we see a little problem is in what we think is an overstressing of the value of indexicals in, 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 in um, as you've just mentioned now, in, in thematization. For example, you right now you, you mentioned the fact that substantives can be good in making calculations, right? But they're not only good for making calculations, they're also good for ontological classification and they're also good for understanding variations in, stem of, in terms of ontological classification. So um, since you, on the other hand, emphasized so much the colonial qualities of knowledge versus perception, right, which is, we think, a leitmotiv in, your, in, your, in, in the book, then we, we, we tend to put together the two things, right? Uh, on the one hand, the... Um, questioning of, uh, of uh, knowledge in terms of uh, colonial appropriation of the other, on the one hand, which is something that surfaces very clearly in the coda of the book, right? And on the other hand, the willingness to um, withdraw from substantivation because of the ontological problems that they may be at stake there. So we just pointing to what we perceive that it is an interesting move, but a move that perhaps is too much overstressed, as those substances would not play an important role in in uh, in any kind of process of knowledge and of dealing with uh, with uh, with the otherwise, right? Well, briefly put, and, and just quickly um, responding to to the two comments that you've made, I, I hope that that um, 
that our position is a little bit more clear perhaps than, than in the paper. We will certainly revise it, nuance it as much as needed um, or as much as we are able to in order to, to um, provide a cleaner version for the publication. But in short, we've, we've just detected two issues that we wanted to highlight in this way, right? Don't know if we want to add time from the side. Um, yeah, Chris, please. Well, John had his hand up first, so I'll, I'll defer to him and then slide in if there's time. That's all right. Go ahead. Sure. Well, it's just it's interesting to um to hear the symptomatic reading of the presence of Jewish animism or monotheism, because in another project that I began um, after my first reading of your book, I, in some sense, read the exact opposite or perhaps not, not the opposite, but something altogether different, uh, another spiritual frame entirely. So in thinking of the connections that you make explicitly to uh, 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 Jeviveros and his anthropological work with uh, Amerindian perspectives on Deixis, uh, it made me think of the work of a philosopher, um, Rodolfo Kusch, who is also very concerned with uh, Deixis, but in a different sense. And so I wondered um, in what Carlos was just saying, he mentioned the colonial character of knowledge over perception. Um, I, but from what I see in your work, I, I don't see it as a prioritization of perception over knowledge or even a prioritization of epistemology over ontology, but rather an assertion of the inextricability of the ethical and the perceptual and the ontological. And um, Kush would say, I think, um, something very similar. In fact, his argument is that, um, although it involves some reification, maybe, um, uh, that the philosophy that begins from what he would call estar, um, and, and maybe with reference to the, the lusophone situation, we might even say maybe a philosophy of ficar, uh, is rather different from a philosophy of ser in as much as the ontological character of knowledge that's being posited isn't, doesn't purport to be one of neutrality, of mastery, but rather a response to menace. And so for Kush, the indexical situation as he sees it and a star itself is fundamentally characterized um, as a response to what he refers to as the wrath of the gods. But uh, in this way, the, the jaguar is coming. The kaiman is coming. Uh, you, you can't but be concerned for it, but in your concern, you're also aware that not only will your understanding or thematization of the lingering threat uh, guarantee your survival, but also that it is does it fails to exhaust, in some sense, all of the other menacing elements or comforting elements that remain beyond your horizon and continue to shape your horizon. So uh, for me, um, the... I, the Amerindian spirituality, to speak in extraordinarily broad and in, 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 uh, in some sense uh, unacceptable terms, uh, is far more present than whatever appeals. In fact, I would see it as a counterbalance to what we might rightly assert as a latent Jewish monotheism within the Levinasian frame. So uh, this, this is my, my humble contribution. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree completely. I think, uh, I think, for instance, um, the idea that uh, of uh, the idea of placing ethics before ontology is uh, is is one way of putting it, and one way that may help you know understanding what is what is going on. Because certainly, for living as there is an ethical concern that is. Uh, that is central, but the thing is, it, the thing is, it is very important that it is entangled with uh, with 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 ontology. What I, what I try to do is to understand this this uh, press this um, uh, pool of the other, uh, both uh, or uh, both in a in a metaphysical sense uh, and in a sense that uh, we can call it uh, uh, parametaphysic. Uh, parametaphysical, a sense that comes from, from outside your concern about uh, discovering and thematizing the world. So in a sense, I, I would say that this entanglement is, is pretty much, uh, has to be there. And in a sense, I think uh, I wanted to apply this to the, 
to the to, to concerns about uh, about perception uh, and therefore to some extent to the epistemology of perception because I think the I think the epistemology of perception is and that's the idea of hospitality there it's it is um, entangled with the issue of uh, the other as uh, as the other appears uh, now uh, I would say that uh, all these three categories uh, or four categories in fact that uh, we tend to use here ethics uh, ontology metaphysics and epistemology this these four categories they are uh, they are rendered problematic because in a sense they are they were forged in a in a in a philosophical environment that uh, basically uh, understood it was basically committed to um, to a metaphysics um, uh, let's put it this way but metaphysics of presence to 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 be very short it was committed it, it, it is within that framework that uh, those categories appear. And uh, as we move away from, from, from that towards uh, paradoxical metaphysics of the other, uh, of the others, then in a sense, you know, these categories, they, uh, they, I think they tend to be so entangled with each other that they, it, it, it's, it's maybe not so productive to separate, especially metaphysics from ethics. And I think this is very important for living as already. And then you've got the epistemologic epistemology of perception, as I tried to work. And then, of course, there is um, there is also the, the the concern about ontology, which is uh, uh, a word that I try that I I try to avoid uh, because basically I think uh, it is the use of the word is often attached. To the idea that uh, of a priority of being over other elements of reality, or basically the idea that being ontologism is, is the word uh, uh, Levinas used, which is the idea that being is all that uh, is in reality. If that uh, if that kind of make makes makes sense. So yes, I think uh, I agree with your comments. I think I spoke too much. I think John, there is John, and there is um, I don't know, and there is Carlos here. There is John, and then Paul. I don't know. Uh, you self chair yourselves, I don't know. Uh, maybe John first. Thanks, Carlos and Sophia, for uh, this paper. I found it really interesting. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to pull out uh, one sentence from uh, the print version that you sent out. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think the internet is a little bit. Either our internet or your internet. Could no, you could I, you I kindly go 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 again because we've lost the continuity of your of your of your speech. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay, um, I started out just by thanking you for the paper, okay. um, <laughs> and then uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to pull out one sentence uh, from the, uh, the draft that we received that I think uh, put on the table something that's going to remain absolutely crucial. Um, just my prediction uh, in uh, in the further discussion, and that's uh, your brief remarks on analogy. I quote: "Like ours, the conceptual worlds of those extra moderns about whom uh, Ben Susan writes in dialogue with other people." present something more than dactics. That is, their meaning elicitation is surely based on an analogical flow. An analogy can be deemed indexical due to its double, in fact, quadruple proportional qualities, but it transcends perception and opens up a possible world made of myths, rituals, and a number of other, both non-substantive and substantive things, which exceed Ben Susan's neo-empiricism. Um, there's a lot going on there, uh, including the treatment of analogy as a possible indexical. And I wanted to push that a little bit, and in so doing, uh, maybe push it on a little bit. Uh, so it's very clear that you're not talking about uh, Thomistic analogy, but quite the opposite, right? Um, analogy as sameness of form. 
if I understand you properly. Um, sameness of form uh, as the basis of another non-indexical dimension of perception, uh, one in which uh, the perspectival element in some way, of course, is there, but then perhaps cancels itself out. Uh, the two references that come to mind are A, obviously Plato on the divided line, um, and uh, also, importantly, I think, Peirce. So for Peirce, as we know, um, the index is meaningless alone. It's only in the triad of icon, index, and symbol that we can understand what an indexical is. And just to focus on the first two, I think with your talk of analogy, you've put the notion of the icon on the table, uh, the icon as that which signifies by sameness of form. It was interesting to me that the term icon doesn't appear in the book uh, except for one unrelated use, uh, like an icon of, of something uh, being uh, the paradigm or the famous version of it. Um, so I wanted, you, I wanted to ask you whether you would accept the formulation in terms of iconicity and uh, whether you would accept um, this problematic of the relation between at least icon and index as something um, worth pushing back on in the text. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John. Thank you so much. This is extremely interesting. Uh, in fact, we were not having in mind um, Thomistic analogy, but we were working with, uh, with uh, analogy as uh, um, uh, it comes out from very early, late 1960s till very recently, last uh, book published posthumously in 2020, in the Anthropology of the Meaning of Roy Wagner. Right. So that is our, our referent. And this is what uh, what we had in mind when, when we wrote this. Um, I had I, I need to confess that personally, I had not thought about it in terms of the possible connection between iconicity and indexicality. But I like it a lot. I like a lot what you're suggesting here, because the example that we would uh, work with is as follows, right? And it is an example that actually uh, emphasizes the immense value what, of what Ilan is doing in the sense that he's saying that indexicals are ultimate. So the example that, that I'm going to try to very briefly present shows how indexicality is behind substantial, substantivity, right? And how uh, indexicality is behind uh, substantivity through an analogical flow in which substantives are mm, appear, take shape because of positionality. And this positionality has something to do with iconicity. Let's go with the example to see if it, it, it makes any sense. So the example could be um, in an extra modern tribe, someone calls himself a parrot, right? By calling himself a parrot, this someone distinguishes himself first, sorry, by analogy, he comes close to other members of his own tribe and distinguishes himself from the members of a different tribe that instead of uh, parrots can be, I don't know, any other kind of, of, uh, of totemic being, right? Any other kind of, 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 uh, of, uh, of animal, right? At the same time, this person declares himself to be a man, right? And by declaring himself to be a man, he makes an analogy with other members of his own tribe, which have a similar social role, and at the same time distinguishes himself from other members of his same, not only tribe, but family, who have a completely different social role. And in the third place, the same person who is there for a parrot has declared himself to be a parrot, has declared himself to be a man, he declares himself to be a jaguar, by which he distinguishes himself from people, both from his tribe and any other tribe that do not take the role of shaman. And he becomes closer, he analogizes himself with other people of other tribes who may be shamans as himself. So any of these substantives, parrot, 
uh, jaguar, and what may be even more impressive, man, are actually metaphors. That is to say, are analogical relations that are established through a flow that, that posits at the same time sameness and difference. And in a way, it could be said, perhaps we would have to think about this, that apart from being indexicals in a certain way, in the sense that behind these nouns, what we find are relations of similarity and opposition between someone here and someone there. At the same time, the value of any of these substantives is clearly iconic, right? In a certain way, right? So, I mean, this is my, my immediate reaction to what you say, and, and I find it extremely interesting, right? The possibility, therefore, to, 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 um, uh, to bring together iconicity and, and, and indexicality. Well, this is mostly the idea of analogy that we were playing with. Um, the thesis of Roy Wagner is that actually uh, analogy produced in this way is behind, and it's kind of the web that sustains all meaning production. And that it is only through crystallization, a specific crystallization of any of these images, of any of these substantives, that convention appears, right? Um, as a as a um, as a cold regime, if you wish, of what would be the activity of the, the meaning in a specific um, social group, right? Yeah, well, thanks a lot, yeah. Interesting, actually. Um, that, that's wonderfully helpful, thank you. And uh, I think it's great. And so I, I don't know the anthropological literature anywhere near as much uh, as I need to in order to understand this conversation. Uh, so I'm particularly grateful uh, that you took the time to explain it there. Uh, and in an interdisciplinary setting uh, like this, I really hope that we continue to do that. Um, I don't think there's any implied insults involved. Uh, we're gonna have to keep explaining uh, things that are, are really familiar to each of us. Thank you again. Thank, thank you again, thanks. Well, given it is five o'clock, I don't know if Paul wants to um, ask his question or move directly uh, to his. Mine, mine can wait. It will come out in, in my paper anyway, so we, we can go ahead. Okay, so uh, for your co host, so whenever you want, you can share your screen. And uh, yeah, so uh, Paul Livingston. One minute. We can see perfectly, yeah. Clients. We are right, can we see? The conclusions. Mm -hmm. So um, first, let me very much um, th thank you, Yuan, um, for both for inviting me um, to uh, to do this and also for his book, which I think is, is a remar remarkable book in, in many, many different ways. Um, uh, only a few of which I'll be able to, to touch on, I think. Um, here. Um, and let me also thank, thank others who um, I had the opportunity to discuss this paper with, um, John Bova, um, John Cogburn, um, and other members of what we've taken to call the, uh, to calling the, the consequences of logical consequence um, reading group, um, which we've yeah, um, been discussing some of these issues over the last few, uh, discussing Helen's book and, and discussing some of the issues uh, around indexicalism over the last um, several meetings. Um, so my, my paper is titled uh, The Irreducible Paradoxical, uh, you are he subtitled You Are Here Now. Um, and I'll try to talk about, um, I don't know, I'll try to keep it relatively short, 40, 40 to 45 minutes or so, um, and leave the rest of the time for, um, for discussion. And thank you, and also for um, giving me a little bit extra um, time since my paper was, was rather long. Um, and um, the, my paper starts to kind of in three sections. Um, with uh, what is actually for me a little bit of kind of um, methodological self-reflection. Um, and um, that kind of self-reflection is always a bit, as you know, nar narcissistic. So I hope you'll indulge me um, in, uh, in this um, about metaphysics and the um, connection to um, indexicalism will become clear in a minute. But I wanted to start with a remark 
uh, by Aristotle from the last work, the Protrapticus. Um, and uh, this is a protraptical um, uh, work in which he is exhorting, one of his aims is to exhort uh, people, specifically young people, uh, to do philosophy. Uh, and he gives this following quite interesting argument, um, which I think is, is worthy of, of, of reflection. Um, and uh, one of the things we can also notice in the argument as it's passed down to us, of course, is it's essentially indexical appeal um, directed to a you in the second person, um, you know, who is being, um, being addressed and discussed as a potential, for, you know, a, a, and um, thereby kind of in a certain way um, interpolated as a, as a potential philosopher. Um, so Aristotle says this, um, according uh, to the sources that we have, if you should do philosophy, you should do philosophy. And if you should not do philosophy, then you should do philosophy. Therefore, in every case, you should do philosophy. Or if philosophy exists, then positively we are, we are obliged to do philosophy since it truly exists. But if it does not truly exist, even so we are obliged to investigate how it is that philosophy does not truly exist. But by investigating, we would be doing philosophy since to investigate is the cause of philosophy. So I wanna just um, step back a little bit, reconstruct the argument a little bit or reconstruct one um, kind of uh, one kind of structure that may be uh, behind it. And my aim there is you know, not to endorse the argument, um, but to kind of pull out something that I think is a presupposition there, which comes into critical focus for us if we try to kind of reflect on this, on the structure of what he's arguing in the context of what we know to be Aristotle's um, larger project. So if we take this argument, which we've just um, heard, in light of Aristotle's understanding of there being something of course, he doesn't call it metaphysics, that, that name is, is, is labeled later, is added later, but something that he does term as a science of being qua being. Um, or we could say, I think, um, without violence to Aristotle, of beings as such, entities as such, um, and as a whole. Um, then we uh, have the, we can re reconstruct the argument in the following kind of way. Either there is a general object, a subject matter for such a science, that is a science of beings as such and as a whole, or a science of being qua being. Um, or so either that subject matter exists or it does not. This is exhaustive and ex the alternatives are apparently exhaustive and exclusive. If one, it exists, that subject matter, the general, the generality of beings as such, then there is philosophy as the inquiry into that subject matter, straightforwardly. But if two, and the general object of metaphysics does not exist, even so, it will still be possible on Aristotle's principles to show this. And in the demonstration and showing it and pursuing it and even asking the question, we will already be doing philosophy. So either way, there is philosophy as inquiry into, general, into, the, into the maximally general. Um, this is the, the generality that he distinguishes quite clearly in, in Metaphysics 4 from the specificity of the various more specific um, sciences that have more delimited subject matters. Um, so either, um, either way, whether that general subject matter exists or, or does not, there is philosophy as inquiry into the general, and we must do it um, as soon as we ask any question at all. And this is because questioning for Aristotle inquiry is proceeding to principles and causes, and that, that um, always goes in the direction of, of greater generality, at least insofar as we're interested in it um, in the context of this kind of, this kind of inquiry. Okay, so I wanna just ask um, now, what, uh, are there any presuppositions to this, um, this protreptic argument? In other words, is there a silent presupposition to the, ar to the argument's success? to the necessity that he, uh, that he inscribes in the pursuit of philosophy. Um, and can we think about that, that um, precondition? And I, I would suggest that yes, there is a precondition, silent in the argument itself, but very marked in Aristotle's metaphysics. Um, and that is the constitution of metaphysics, we might say, by means of the law or the principle of non-contradiction. So this is the principle that he announces familiarly in, in Metaphysics 4, this is the second quote um, there on the, on the slide. Um, the uh, principle that uh, is the most certain um, and that which is this, the, the special um, domain or the special privilege of the philosopher, that um, most certain principle of all that which is regarding which is impossible to be mistaken, uh, which principle is this we proceed to say, here's one, one of the statements of the law or principle of non-contradiction, the same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject um, in the same respect. And um, I, so I, I'm just, you know, um, sort of thinking that we might be kind of like attentive to this, this, this moment, right? And we might be attentive to this moment where contradiction is as such excluded. Um, and with it, of course, paradox, uh, antinomy, all those kinds of other figures of contradictory argument, which already before 
um, Aristotle, Zeno, for example, had practiced, um, and then another example, which is which I'm going to say something else about in a minute, um, would be the dialectical exercise of Plato's dialogue Parmenides, um, in which we get this kind of investigation into the one and the others, um, and an apparently multiply contradictory conclusion, whether the one exists or does not exist, both it and the others are and are not in all kinds of different ways and have all kinds of different, different properties and, and so forth. Right? Um, so, uh, so what I want to suggest, um, and just the point of the first quote there is just to kind of notice how Aristotle within, uh, in constituting metaphysics in this kind of way is this kind of general space in which it is possible to apply the law of non-contradiction and in so doing, uh, understand a general space for inquiry, either there is or there is not with respect to everything, but also um, particularly with respect to the totality of, of beings, he thinks difference in a particular kind of way. Um, and indeed, specifically, and this, this brings us uh, already closer to Elon's um, 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 concerns uh, and, and to the question of indexicality, um, as a kind of indexicality. Difference is, for Aristotle, a kind of, uh, a kind of otherness. And he seems to be, perhaps, we can return to this, um, they're adopting the kind of story that uh, Plato has the Eleatic stranger visitor um, tell in the, in the sophist um, about difference, um, namely, uh, and, and a, as, a, as a way of, of addressing the question of negation that comes from, that comes from Parmenides, um, that negation is really, um, is really difference and, and otherness. Um, so, um, so what I wanted to suggest is this, that you know, in, a, in a way that should be kind of familiar, I think, or kind of intelligible, um, metaphysics we can see is constituted by the philosopher's non-hypothetical knowledge of the law of non-contradiction. Um, applying this knowledge requires seeing negation as a kind of otherness or difference, as indeed in Plato's sophist, um, and domesticating, so to speak, its indexicality, that is the indexical uh, aspect of otherness or difference within a general categorical framework whose scope and applicability is assured by means of a general application of, of the law of non-contradiction. Um, the scope is also, that scope of application is also understood by Aristotle as the space of possibilities in general, um, and this is another aspect of his, of his project that's very you know, obviously marked in, in the metaphysics, um, in which potency or dunamis becomes applicable to all that is capable of change and becoming. Um, so, okay, so I wanted to say about the, the um, protraptic argument that that argument that we started with is kind of like a double bind. Um, it's like, you know, either way, right, you have to do philosophy. Um, either there is a totality or it's not, you must, um, those, those Alternatives are exhaustive and exclusive. Either way, you have to uh, you, ha you have to do you can, and you also have to do philosophy. So in that way, metaphysics understood that way within the medium of non-contradiction, in a certain sense, immunizes itself against its own possible critique. Right. So whatever I might say, at least on the basis of a question about totality, does this kind of totality of beings really exist um, or not? Either way, right. According to that argument, given the principle of non-contradiction as applied to it, you have to um, you have to do you have to do philosophy. Um, but if, right, there is some reason internally to, um, to a certain kind of questioning, uh, let's say, um, to doubt the general assurance of the law of non-contradiction, um, or if more spe specifically thinking about totality as a poriatic, it's contradictory or as anton antonymical, um, whether we affirm or deny its existence, then the double bind is transformed, I'm going to suggest, into a critical aporia. Um, and so I have in mind here a kind of form of argument, which you can see in a lot of um, different examples drawn all of these, um, unfortunately, uh, from Western philosophy. I think you could also take some for sure from Indian philosophy, which would be um, uh, something else perhaps to talk about. But um, uh, examples uh, of the kind of argument that I have in mind about totality uh, are, for example, Zeno uh, on likeness and unlikeness, Plato's Parmenides, I already mentioned the dialectical exercise about the one and the others. Um, in the second part of the, the Parmenides, um, Kant's cosmological antinomies, Russell's paradox, um, and um, more, more, most recently um, and locally Deleuze in the beginning of the logic of sense on, on paradoxical sense. And I also have in mind as kind of a precedent here or kind of a structure that I, I, I drew on somewhat, um, what Graham Priest, uh, for those who are familiar with his work, calls the, the enclosure um, schema, which is a general form of kind of um, contradictory uh, argumentation, arguments with, with contradictory con conclusions um, that are for him, uh, pre uh, for a priest about the limits of thought, broadly speaking. Um, so let me just suggest the following structure, and I think the, kind of the best way to kind of see it um, would be to think about Kant's antinomies, um, and in particular, maybe the first antinomy is kind of the best example 
uh, of this kind of um, this kind of argument structure. Um, but um, what I you know have in mind is kind of just looking at the argument itself um, before we get to kind of Kant's transcendental idealism as a solution to the the contradictoriness of the uh, of the the um, totality of appearances. Um, let's not worry about that. Um, but let's just look at the argument um, itself. And I think so broadly speaking, and this is this is true of all of, all four of the antinomies. Um, they, it has a kind of twofold structure, um, starting with the present given moment, uh, a this, a here, a now, or a one. Um, for example, a given moment in, in time, uh, or a given um, moment of uh, in a series of, uh, of appearances. Um, it, later on, we get uh, decomposition of, of a, of a um, given entity into its, into its elements um, and other kinds of examples. But, um, first, starting with the given moment, I can ask about its prior conditions. We might say it's others. Um, and if any one such condition about its prior and so forth. And this gives us the antithesis argument in the, in the um, first antinomy, the antithesis is there is no beginning to the universe in time um, and there is uh, no limit to the universe um, in space. The, pro the point there is that we can always continue the process of inquiry back another step. We can always sort of say, well, what's the condition of that, of that condition? What's the condition of then that, uh, that condition and so forth? Um, and we can keep going, right? But number two, I can also ask, and this gives me the thesis argument um, in each case, with respect to this present given moment about the totality of conditions or the generality of the others from which it arises. Um, so I can ask about the present moment. Well, what about the totality of moments that precede it? And kind of will argue at least that the present moment, it's happening um, now here. This is the indexical aspect of it requires the existence of this big um, infinite uh, totality that, pre that precedes it. So given those two kinds of movements of thought, um, what the one that's evident in the antithesis and the one that's evident in the thesis, uh, in the argument for the, for the antithesis and the thesis, um, contradiction will result whether I affirm the existence of the totality or not, right? And I want to suggest this is maybe a little bit um, 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 uh, argumentative, right? But I want to suggest that what we're getting in both of those two moments is essentially and irreducibly an indexical kind of movement. Um, there is, we're starting with a present now, a here, an object in front of me, uh, a moment uh, in the history of the universe um, or in the history of the world. And we are asking about the conditions of that, of that thing. And I want to say just kind of, or just kind of assert, we can, people can argue with me if, if we disagree, that the arguments themselves require no reference to a totality beyond the, that which is already arguably involved in the possibility of indexical reference to a now, a then, a here, and a there um, in general. And no, neither of the, you know, uh, neither sides of the, of the antinomy require something like a view from nowhere. And that's not always evident in, in kind of reconstructions of, of uh, how the antinomical uh, uh, arguments work. Um, but uh, I think I think it can be um, sustained. So I'm just arguing for kind of an indexalist, indexicalist interpretation, if you like, of the um, of the kind of paradoxical antonym, antonymical um, argument. So there are reasons to think, and this is a um, it's, so, so one of the uh, ways that um, that uh, Elon's book really um, really uh, develops a convincing, I think, kind of um, of story about the implications of indexicalism. Um, is by drawing on something you know long known to um, analytic philosophers that um, was pointed out maybe first um, uh, one, one, um, one uh, moment of it um, is in the uh, argument of, of McTaggart, um, but also more recently by John Perry and David Lewis, um, other other philosophers, um, that some indexical information is irreducible. So I want to kind of focus, you know, um, not simply on the thesis that indexical information is primary in some sense, but that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, irreducible to any kind of objective third person knowledge um, or information. So for familiar, at least to, at least to some, um, Perry gives the example of, you know, you're, he's um, pushing a shopping cart around a, a, around a store, um, notices that somebody has been dropping flour on the, on the, on the, on the floor um, and, you know, wonders who it is and then comes to realize, oh, I'm the person, you know, there was a, a leaky bag in my, in my cart. I'm the person who was doing that. I'm the messy, uh, I'm the messy shopper. Uh, we have examples also from Perry of two people who are uh, imprisoned in, li in uh, at libraries, identical from the inside, but at, uh, at opposite ends of North America. Um, and they uh, also have amnesia, so they don't know who they, who they are, they don't know their names. Um, the point being that they can, uh, whatever uh, objective information 
accessible from a third person point of view. They can read about, about uh, the, the facts of the world. They still don't know which library, each one doesn't know which library he's in um, and indeed who he is. Uh, he can find out that information and that seems to be information that is additional to the totality of third person available um, objective information. Um, or just kind of a more um, kind of <laughs> um, close to home for many of us example, uh, the insomniac who lies in bed um, at night wondering, um, you know, what time is it? Um, and when this person comes to find out what time it is, right, they locate themselves, um, but in a way that would not be reflected by any objective description of the world from a third person and tenseless point of view, because after all that would be about all the facts about what time it is now. Um, at any rate, um, so I think that gives us, uh, and McTaggart's appeal to the, uh, to the irreducibility of the so-called A series, uh, which is to say temporal relations specified in terms of um, now, past with respect to now, future with respect to, to now, um, that this, this information is in some way irreducible to uh, what he calls B series relationships. I think that also gives us a, uh, uh, um, sufficient reason to think that we can't add up all the indexical information into a single total picture of the world that's inconsistent because the various true indexicals are already inconsistent with one another, right? Um, that which, is, that which is, is now, now will later on be not now. Um, and um, that's already sufficient reason to think that there can't be, uh, if we take index, irreducible indexicals seriously, a consistent view of the totality of beings or of facts, right? So um, that's a quick read. Um, but um, this shows that there cannot be a position from the, which uh, the sense of things in general or the space of their possibilities is overall consistent. So I want to combine that with that consideration about the essential or irreducible um, uh, indexical uh, with what we saw from the kind of cosmo the ant antinomical kinds of arguments, um, the cosmological antinomies um, that should seem to show us that there is no consistent totality. There is no consistent totality that includes all the facts. Right? So let's return then to the to Aristotle's original uh, protreptic argument um, and to what are the implications of that for something like a project like Aristotle's project of a science of, of being, knowledge of being, um, qua being. Uh, and so here I quote Cogburn, um, Elon Paulos Cogburn, um, in uh, specifying kind of the genre of, of his project as a paradoxical metaphysics. Um, Cogburn says, metaphysics aims to give a maximally general account of what reality is like, such that we encounter the phenomena that we do. But what if we encounter phenomena such as the Berkeley Fichte, Berkeley Fichte and Kant Russell arguments that seem to entail that metaphysics physics is impossible? And these are similar in structure to the arguments that, that I talked about a minute ago. Um, then the task, of, the task of metaphysics is to give a maximally general account of what reality is like such that metaphysics is impossible. So I want to just put a little bit of pressure on that last sentence of Cogburn's um, designation or, or, um, or invocation of a paradoxico metaphysics. And I want us to kind of bear in mind that, um, you know, and kind of hear the similarity of this as well to Aristotle's original protreptic argument, right? So it looks like, well, you know, if, again, if there's, uh, you know, if there's uh, a totality that's consistent, that's, that's fine, right? Then we could do metaphysics. But if we encounter the paradox, then Cogburn says, uh, at the level of totality, then Cogburn says, well, um, then let's, let's just, um, you know, do paradoxical metaphysics. Um, I think that is a little bit problematic because I, um, I think that with the antinomic arguments, the necessity of metaphysics that's attested to by Aristotle's protreptic argument is rather transformed into a double aporia. Both the existence and the non-existence of totality have the implication uh, that, the, uh, that our talk about the totality is contradictory. Um, and so from that position, and this is just more a question that I wanted to kind of put to, to Elon, um, maybe it's rather quick, right? Um, it seems that there cannot be a paradoxical metaphysics, right? But there is, and I want to I want to not just say something negative here, I want to say something positive. There is a critical use of paradox that is also indicative with respect, I claim, to a more original situation. And this use is a critique of the assumption of non-contradictory and unitary sense that makes metaphysics possible or constitutes metaphysics indeed uh, in the medium of, of possibility. Um, okay, so this is, uh, okay, I'm just looking at time here. Uh, section two is metaphysics, violence, and critique. And here I wanna push a little bit, um, uh, oh, I wanna uh, you know, formulate some questions for you, Lana, but also by way of pushing a little bit on Levinas. Um, and on the kind of um, specific kind of use that Elon wants to make um, of, of Levinas. Um, but I want to sort of uh, 
consider, you know, what I just argued for is a critical use of thought about, uh, of indexicalist thought, um, and indexicalist thought insofar as it, as we can recognize with the kind of antonymical arguments that, um, um, that, I, that I discussed, that we can recognize uh, indexical thought as tending toward thinking about the conditions of the present, uh, while at the same time showing sufficiently already in itself the incoherence um, or the contradictoriness of any total picture that we might have of those, of those conditions. Um, so metaphysics then um, is, and I think one of the great strengths, uh, even just on kind of like an ethical or an ethical political register of Elon's book is that how he shows this, that metaphysics um, as the activity of making sense of beings as such and as a whole can be understood as promulgating a distinctive power and also a distinctive violence. And the way I love this um, terminology, because I think it's very appropriate, um, the operation of this violence is an extraction of, in, of intelligibility where, uh, or indeed we might say, I think an extraction of sense from a position of mastery over a presumptively consistent whole or space of possibilities. So that when I encounter from this position, um, the other or an other, any other, what I wanna do primarily is appropriate and extract its sense or its intelligibility for my own projects um, as you know, puts it very nicely to kind of secure the, um, the future so that the future will be you know, from this position, able to be regularized or able to be um, to be to be dominated. Um, the violent, so this violent extraction of intelligibility, I would argue, presupposes something like Aristotle's construction. That is a unitary space of possibility, and this presupposes the determinacy of sense in general that is constituted in, in Aristotle specifically by the adoption and the authority of the law of non-contradiction. Um, this constitution of the space as consistent is what makes possible the power of he who is capable of mastering sense in general, and of course, in the Western tradition, it is typically thought of as, as he. Um, the critical antinomic arguments uh, that we've considered then show first the real structure of this claim to power, but also the incoherence of its claims. And it follows that the project of metaphysics as the extraction of intelligibility cannot succeed. And so when I have in mind a critical use of the paradoxical arguments and of indexicalism in, in, in general, this is the use that I have uh, that I have in mind of showing that this project of metaphysics, that of setting upon uh, beings to extract their intelligibility or extract their sense, um, cannot ultimately serve the ends of the power that it attempts to promote. So it, it can't um, it can't be uh, ultimately successful. Um, so this uh, I think is connected to a critique of or can be connected is is um, rightly connected to. Um, a critique of what we might understand in Aristotle and in other um, uh, strands of Western philosophy um, as the privilege of the human. So um, this, uh, the capacity of the human to master sense in a unitary fashion is what metaphysics since Aristotle constitutes as possibility. Um, and the critique of this production of unitary sense is then a critique of the privilege of the human, the privilege of that being which is seen as endowed with the capacity of reasoning and thus also capable of mastering the possibilities in general of lives and things. And so I wanted to just push a little bit or, or inquire into a little bit the logic of a counterviolence to this violence of totality um, and uh, think of it as a matter of articulating a more, uh, a more original structure and showing indeed the undecidability of this, um, of this more original structure. So this is where I kind of um, encounter Levinas and um, I, uh, I think that there's there you know certainly some kind of um, ambiguities to Levinas's project thought in kind of the terms that I'm that I'm trying to think and that, that I think also um, we can you know talk more about this. I think there are kind of ways in which I'm going to argue that to, to Elon that you should be a little bit more critical, um, perhaps from from your indexical close position of of some of Levinas's um, assumptions. Um, so Levinas suggests sometimes, and this is quite interesting. Um, when he, especially when he dis distinguishes metaphysics and metaphysical desire from ontology, ontology as something that we do in a theoretical um, attitude. Uh, ontology is something, as you mentioned before, um, that presupposes that all there is to being is being, as it were, or all there is um, to, to our concern should be being. Sometimes suggests that metaphysics can produce itself as critique rather than as ontology. Um, and uh, this would be a, a gesture or kind of a moment at which metaphysics recoils on itself, asks about its own conditions of possibility. And he even says in the beginning, toward the beginning of Totality Infinity, that this is exactly the moment that he, he understands as ethics, right? So I think we should, we can be in a certain way sympathetic to that, right? Um, but at the same time, I think um, there are some questions about the extent, uh, there are some very good questions about the extent um, to which 
Levinas's critique can really be a kind of counter violence to the violence of the, or a, a kind of critique of violence um, to, the, to the violence of the, of the human. Um, and so far as, as Ilan really nicely points out in his book, um, Levinas tends to propose the, 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 um, the critique of violence or, or ethics indeed, um, as in general presupposing an address or manifestation of the other as essentially a human encounter. And this is kind of a specific limitation of, of Levinas's um, thinking that I think others have kind of pointed out, um, Derrida as well. Um, and with such, a, with such a, a critique or such an ethics, we can't really adequately address the violence of the human as such, I would argue. Um, and thereby, um, this is something that Elon really argues for, very well for, it can't do justice to what we might call the great outdoors, to all the non-human, extra-human aspects of, um, of the world and uh, entities and lives uh, around us. Um, so um, I, I wanted to follow a little bit Levinas's own logic of the infinite. Um, this also comes very clearly in Derrida's uh, Violence and Metaphysics. Um, as a, a, a broad critique. Um, Levinas thinks the relationship to the other singular, um, and this uh, is where one might kind of raise, begin to raise a certain kind of question. Um, I mean, grammatically singular, even if he means by this any other, any, any other in general. Um, and, um, but what I'm specifically interested in is the, is the relationship that Levinas himself thinks of my address to the other or the other's relationship to me as one across an infinite, um, an infinite height. Um, infinite means something like absolute, at least I would argue in loving us, as a maximum of height, which is beyond any spatial or empirical height. So whatever, you know, however high the other is in space, literally in space, the height of ethics is beyond, is beyond that. Um, and so I, I don't want to challenge that or just kind of contest it, although I think you could raise questions about the relationship as we were talking about it um, just before of this to monotheism, um, broadly speaking, um, and also uh, to, I think this is something where I would even more want to kind of push um, to platonic metaphors that, that Levinas um, uses quite a bit, um, and specifically the one beyond being of, of Plato's Republic. Um, the good beyond being a place public later on, understood as a, as a one in, in Neoplatonism. Um, at any rate, uh, what's the indexical form, I want to ask, of this appeal to absolute height? In other words, if we really kind of rigorously adopt indexicalism, a position that indexicals are the primary, um, are the primary thing, how can we understand this appeal to the relationship to the other that, that's infinitely um, it's infinitely or in the sense of absolutely high, right? Well, I would say indexically, this isn't up there, right? So it's a pointing. Um, it's a gesture for that, that when I encounter the other, I understand the other or relate to the other only as an up there, but it's an up there of a curious, uh, in a curious way, because of the non-reversibility of this, of this up there, the asymmetry of it, it's never an up here for anyone um, or anything, right? Um, but that might be okay, right? I don't, I don't want to challenge that just, you know, in and of, its, um, in and of itself. It's just an interesting indexical um, kind of logic, but uh, I do want to push a little bit on the concept of the infinite. Um, this concept of alterity as infinite height requires a classic conception of the infinite according to its, uh, to which it's number one, definitionally or axiomatically non-total. So for Levinas from the very title of this work, you know, on, on um, the infinite in the sense in which he is, uh, he is interested in it is opposed to totality and an infinite infinity cannot be total um, just, just as such. Um, I think that has, we could argue about this, but I think this has something like the status of an axiom for, for Levinas. Um, and it's also absolute in the sense of maximal or unincreasable, but nevertheless, I would argue still consistent. Nothing that Levinas says, at least that I know of, um, gives us to think that the absolute height of the other requires or involves that the other be inconsistent with itself or that the position from which one sees any other is itself an inconsistent position. Um, and I think that's problematic. Um, for example, I mean, one way it's problematic is that after Conter's um, work in, in set theory, um, at least if we, if we credit that work as having some kind of significance relevant um, to these kinds of concerns, we can think, number one, that there are some infinite totalities, right? So there are totalities such as the set of all, whole, um, all finite um, whole numbers, uh, omega, uh, which, is, which is a set of all, that is a totality, and yet infinite. Um, number one, maybe that's not the most serious challenge, but number two, on the level of the absolute, that an absolute or unincreasable infinite is essentially inconsistent. And there are simple kind of set theoretical arguments that, um, that, that tend to show this. Um, and one of them is so-called um, uh, uh, 
uh, Counter's paradox, which was which was known um, to Counter and others, just Russell's paradox, um, as you know, kind of we're, we're familiar um, with. So these these arguments seem to show that if we think about a kind of absolute totality, if we think about, for example, um, you know, all the sets or all the numbers or something like that, we're going to have something that is essentially um, inconsistent. Uh, and so it isn't in that kind of um, absolute consistent and infinite in the sense in which I think Levinas um, requires. Um, also, right, and this is kind of moving closer to um, uh, Levinas's um, own precedence. Um, following Plato in the Republic, the other is for Levinas something like I would want to suggest the figure of a one beyond being. And again, that's the kind of Neoplatonic gloss on uh, what, what Plato already says in the Republic that um, there is a good. Um, that is elevated beyond being in rank and in power um, and is a source both of, of the being of, of, of uh, entities, but also the being of forms um, and uh, is the source of intelligibility for these things as well. Um, so this is not, uh, I think, in Levinas an appeal simply to theology, and maybe this is part of the issue about monotheism um, or, or not. Um, it's not an appeal to theology, only, but only because the analogy of this uh, the, of the analogy that, that Levinas will draw of this theological one to anyone in general, and of course to anyone to which, whom I may ethically relate, anyone in any one particular, right? So here he has in mind that that uh, in the encounter with a person, or I think primarily a person for Levinas, um, that one is related to this uh, to this other in a similar fashion, an analogous fashion to the way that uh, Plato is suggesting that we may relate to the good um, beyond being. Um, but this analogy, I would say, um, you know, and this, I, I'm here following Derrida to some extent, um, can only be an analogy um, that is a, a sameness of logic if the address or relationship of the other to me is within a common space, the space of a logos that we share. Um, and as Derrida argues, this assumption of a unitary logos is not separable from a humanism in general, which again limits the scope of, of Levinas's um, critique. We can go, I can go into why um, in the discussion if we, if we want to. Um, so, Let's go come back to Elon's book um, and uh, and uh, talk about the consequences of that um, question that I've tried to raise for Levinas um, with respect to this uh, much more expansive project of doing justice to the great outdoors, doing justice to the more than just human, to the, to the more than merely human or to the other than, than merely human. Um, if the great outdoors then is not a most high, right, and I, I, this is a question, right, I don't know. Um, how we should kind of think it's it's logic. Um, but if it's not a most high or not a beyond being, um, I take it it isn't, then we have to think our relationship to it purely indexically as a relationship to an up there in general, as I said, without a, without a, a you know, any up here. Um, and, or maybe just even a, a going with kind of like the dimension of transcendence, just an out there without any kind of figure of height or elevation. And I don't even know if, you know, we can really kind of impose those kinds of figures of, of, of elevation or stratification here. Um, at any rate, we also could not think, I would suggest, this relationship to the great outdoors, potentially, as even possibly a unitary relationship to any one in the singular. Uh, it's to any other, um, and, um, and that means every other. Um, and so I think even the kind of, I would suggest, even kind of the singular, um, you know, the, the singular terminology of the great outdoors might have, might raise a question. Um, is there such a thing, right? Is there something that is just it, right? Um, apparently not, right? But more substantively, I think, we must think that the sense that any other can offer to me or offer to myself has to be open to undecidability, indeterminacy, and contradiction. The reason for that is that we know from these kinds of arguments that whatever we think the great outdoors is or represents to me um, or any particular other who, that I encounter, that that must be another that presents itself, its meaning, its sense to me as undecidable, indeterminate, even potentially contradictory. Um, and so this is not, I would say, to inscribe a new metaphysics or discover a new truth of the whole, but extend the critique of metaphysics to the critique of human violence as the power of the, of the logos um, as such. Okay. And let's see, I'm going to go very quickly. I'm already at 40 minutes, uh, so I'm just going to go very quickly through the last um, section and invite people to kind of return to it in, in um, conversation. Um, but this is a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of an offshoot. Um, I want to consider in the last section knowing that or thinking that, uh, as I suggested in the first section, that metaphysics constitutes a general space of possibility in light of the, um, 
the application that it makes of the principle of, of non-contradiction, I wanted to suggest if we really on indexicalist grounds were to resist that, if we were to resist that gesture of overview of totality that uh, seems constitutive for metaphysics since, since Aristotle, uh, what might modality actually look like? And so I think there I wanted to kind of make some contact and also some critique of um, some contemporary analytic uh, uh, work on, on modality, in particular, the framework of possible worlds or poss and possible worlds um, semantics. Um, and uh, see, you know, kind of just what some of the implications of that of that might might be. Um, so uh, I think we can we can connect uh, views about modality in general to views about meaning or sense. Um, that's a connection that's very uh, marked in in early stages of the analytic traditions, you know, consideration of uh, of modality and meaning. Um, and later seems to be mod modified a bit, um, though I would argue not in a really essential way. Um, by considerations um, from Kripke uh, about metaphysical necessity and a posteriori essences. But I would just kind of bear in mind that what I'm saying about modality is also um, supposed to be a discussion in part of, of sense. The thing I wanted to point out, and this is, I think, interesting, um, is that within kind of the analytic framework, um, despite, you know, kind of a general kind of tendency, I think you would say, to theori theorization and to a certain kind of what Levinas would understand as kind of ontologization, um, there are elements or there are moments of a pretty thoroughgoing indexicalism. Um, and so the example that I have is David Lewis, who's, of course, you know, one of the most um, uh, well-known theorists of the space of, of possible worlds, so-called. Um, actually, Lewis is um, committed to quite a large degree, I would say, of indexicalism um, about possibility and about, about modality. And I think that's, that's at least interesting. Um, so Lewis's indexicalism comprises, as I understand it, at least four different um, claims or, or levels. One is, of course, his modal realism, uh, which is the view that all possible worlds exist um, or are real and have an equal ontological um, status. So for him, I mean, this is kind of the claim that most uh, often kind of um, uh, meets skepticism, um, but, uh, and there are some reasons um, for it, right? But that's closely connected. I just want to kind of note the connection. Um, to his indexicalism about the actual. So in this view, when we say that a world is actual, this is as actual as essentially an indexical term. It means it's the world that we live in. Um, for the other people living in the other worlds, uh, those worlds are, are actual. So um, actual has no you know, elevated status. It, it, it doesn't mean that, the, that, the, that the, 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 this world is somehow more real, uh, more in existence than, than other worlds are all real. Um, but actual is the indexical term, meaning you know, the world that we, that we live in. Um, beyond that, right, uh, Lewis is also indexed to Calist. This comes out in, a, in an article, um, Attitudes, De Dicto and De Se, um, that um, he is uh, a thoroughgoing indexicalist about propositional belief and other propositional attitudes. And one of the, this I think echoes one of the uh, moves of, of Elon's book that's very interesting and, and convincing, um, which is to say that, that apparent, what are apparently intentional attitudes toward propositions such as beliefs um, in the truth of propositions can be understood actually in indexical um, terms. Uh, so on Lewis's gloss of that, of that view, coming to believe a contingent proposition is, uh, is locating oneself in one of the worlds in which that proposition is true. So if I come to believe, for example, that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, right? What I'm saying, what I'm believing is that I am uh, in, located in one of the worlds. There are many possible worlds, some of which he crossed the Rubicon, some of which he didn't, some of which he didn't exist, right? But that I believe myself to be located in one of the worlds in which he crossed the Rubicon. Um, and so basically, um, propositional belief of, in contingencies, at least in general, is self-locational and thus indexical. It's attributing to oneself the property of living in, in one of those worlds. Interestingly, also in terms of, of um, Elon's concerns, right? Um, indexicalism is uh, about... Uh, uh, Lewis also accepts indexicalism or holds indexicalism about attitudes de re, attitudes toward, um, toward particular objects. Uh, these, are, these are actually self-attributions -attribu as above, but sustained in relationship to a particular object that is, you know, here's the cup over here, I believe of the cup that it is, that it is blue, either by, he says, number one, could be knowledge of that object's essence, though that's actually really unusual and difficult for us to have a kind of knowledge, sufficient knowledge of the object's essence. But two, this is the important one for us, an acquaintance relationship with that object, right? So quite like um, uh, the argument in indexicalism, um, the, uh, the, the knowledge um, de re or the relationship de re is sustained basically by an, by an indexically based relationship of acquaintance. Um, 
So my claim is that my suggestion is this, and I just want to kind of explore the suggestion just a little bit. A thoroughgoing index to clits should accept all of these claims, all four of these claims, um, but without making any claim to a view from nowhere of a consistent totality of logical space, because we know there is no such totality. If there, if we think about logical space as a whole, the space of all the possible worlds, we're thinking about a space that is that is inconsistent. Um, and it has, for example, no determinate size um, and uh, no determinate um, contours or, or boundaries. Um, so, um, okay, what I want to suggest is that um, then if we adopt those kinds of, those kinds of views, uh, if we adopt this modal, modal indexicalism in general, then intentionality in general emerges as a matter of indexical self-location. So this is how deeply, you know, um, less than that framework of modality actually lets us think of kind of indexicalism um, and its implications. And in this respect, then intentionality in general has the same form as the kind of self-location that we noted earlier that yields knowledge of an essential indexical, like when Perry discovers that he's the messy shopper or Laupin discovers which library he's in or the insomniac discovers um, which time it is now. Um, but if there is no view from nowhere, uh, that is there is no view of logical space as a whole, right? Then there is a question about this indexical self-location. Indexical self-location then cannot be a matter of having an overview of a total space of possibilities and then somehow locating myself uh, within that space. So I think this is interesting and it's just a problem. I think indexical self-location happens. It does happen even in the kind of modal way that, that Lewis is suggesting, that we come to locate ourselves in some kind of world that we understand to be the world that we, that we live in. And we understand to be alternative to other possible worlds that are, that are not actual, even if actual is just an indexical term itself, right? Um, and yet the way that we do that cannot be what Lewis thinks it is. In other words, it cannot be first, as it were, overviewing the whole space of logical worlds as a consistent plurality, as a consistent totality, and then finding myself somehow within that, that big overarching map. Why? Because the big overarching map doesn't exist. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't at least consistently um, exist. Okay, so I have some material here um, about uh, standard accounts of the semantics of indexicals, and I just want to suggest, I'll, I'll just pass over this quickly, we can return to this in um, discussion. I just want to suggest that there's a problem with this kind of standard semantics in view of these indexicalist considerations, that we would have to return to it, um, to that problem, um, to kind of what, how the, the I, the here, the now actually, actually works. And indeed, to this kind of problematic address that um, the, uh, the functioning of of indexical locations seems to work something in the kind of standard pictures, seems to work something like the kind of you are here marker that you sometimes see on a, on a stationary map and it's in a particular location, right? Um, it doesn't tell me, uh, you know, it doesn't tell me anything about the space. The, the marker itself doesn't tell me anything about the space represented by the map. It just tells me about my relationship to, um, to, to the map. Um, and uh, the, uh, the suggestion is to, is to apply that kind of structure to the modal context as well. I think there's a problem about that because you have to be told where you would be if the word world in, in, um, in question were actual, but it isn't, right? You're not actually there. We can return to that. Um, conclusions, right? So let's go back to the kind of um, critique of consistency um, and you know, the question about consistency overall. Um, and the idea of logical space. Um, the metaphysics of modality is traditionally con constituted as the total space in which non-contradictory inquiry into possibilities is itself possible. Um, in the contemporary development, this constitution takes the form of the constitution of sense as a logical space of distinct worlds, each of which is internally consistent. And I would say also maximally consistent because part of the picture is that possible worlds are um, not only self-consistent with internal to themselves, but maximally self-consistent so that you couldn't add in some sense any more to them without rendering them inconsistent. Um, in light of the indexicalist and antinomics considerations, however, there is no such total and consistent space of possible worlds. Um, consistency, including the maximal consistency of worlds is for reasons that we saw in kind of vague outline, um, is in general undecidable. It cannot be determined in general by any overall uh, rule or single, single framework, for there's no position from which such a rule could be applied. Um, and it follows from that, I, I would argue, that indexical or presentational sense is itself undecidable. There's no way to master in advance the sense that another may present to me or show up as having. So um, tentative conclusions, number one, um, although there are, and, uh, you know, uh, very much welcome um, pushback on these or, or you know, discussion about them. 
Um, although there cannot be an index of closed paradoxical metaphysics, there is a critical use of antinomical, antinomical arguments that indexicalism makes possible. Through this critical use, the general assumptions of the universality of non-contradictory sense and the operation of extraction that that facilitates are undermined. Such an undermining appears crucial if we are to respond to the systematic violence of the anthropic, the violence of the human against everything non-human, um, predicted on the capacity of the human to extract sense in its claims and operations of power over the non-human world. And then both modality and sense are revealed as radically undecidable. That means that there's no rule that can master and no unitary way to dominate the sense that another might, may offer me or that can emerge uh, between us. So I'll stop there. Sorry for the, the length of both, of both the paper and the presentation. <laughs> Should I field questions or? Yeah, well, we're still having problems of sound here. So we were following it in, uh, in YouTube. So I, I think I missed the last bit of, of Paul's talk. Anyways, uh, so Carlos wants to say something and then, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, turning on the video. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, at some point of your, of your presentation, you've uh, related somehow uh, Levinas's approach to otherness beyond being to Plato's approach to Agathon, right, beyond being. Um, I would like to know if you would agree to say that uh, nonetheless, they may seem to be doing things, thinking something very different, right? And uh, if you would agree with that, I would like to ask you to what extent do you think that Glaucon's laugh and Socrates' silent response to Glaucon's laugh may be indicative of the difference of what Plato and Levinas have in mind. Good, um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean to, um, to minimize the specificity of Levinas's application of these kinds of moments. And so there are kind of two moments actually that, that um, have a similar, that I think have a similar structure and a similar kind of difference um, for Levinas. Uh, one being this moment of the, the good, the Agathon beyond being in Plato, the other moment of course being Descartes' idea of the, of the infinite um, at, to which he appeals as these kind of, and sometimes Levinas says these exceptional moments of, of metaphysics, um, internal to metaphysics for, for sure for him, but, but yet exceptional in what they do, right? So I guess I, I so I guess I'd like to hear more about the difference. So I mean, what I understand, and maybe this is just the limitation of my understanding of Levinas, um, is that these are not uh, for him just theological appeals. Um, they're not appeals in particular simply to something like a one um, beyond being, and for example, the the fashion of Neoplatonism of Plotinus or or of, um, of, of uh, maybe Proclus. Um, why? Because they're inscribed very specifically in ethics rather than in something like theology um, for Levinas, which means that the relationship that he's interested in is not the relationship to a singular itantum, a, 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 an absolute one um, beyond, all, beyond all being, but to an, an actual other, to a concrete other, to, to any other um, in general. Is that, is that the, your sense of, uh, or, or does it go further, I guess, than, than that? Sorry, you're muted. No, that's very interesting indeed. Now, I was thinking something else. I was thinking about whether perhaps um, what uh, we can deduce from uh, Glaucon's laugh and Socrates' silent response to it is a, a sort of different kind of paradox, which actually, uh, at least as I read it, uh, and I'm thinking also, for example, in the reading that uh, Felipe Martinez Marzoa makes of it as well. Um, it is actually 
very difficult to possible beyond. Um, and well, I think it's something that it would be interesting also to consider in terms of discussing um, which is the real access that we may have to something like the greater doors to, to use this, this famous term. But I don't want to keep any more time. I just wanted to, to, to make that question. And I found very, very interesting both your, 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 your presentation and, and your comment on this. Thanks a lot. I do think, yeah, silence is, is, is something that would bear more thought here. Um, in, in other words, like, what is that? What is that kind of that, that laughing and that kind of silence doing thought in terms of these, these relationships? Because he's talking. Yes, I think that Gerson, perhaps, or, or I don't know, some, I, I saw another yeah. hand somewhere. Well, John is, is saying something in the chat. Yeah, um, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, so uh, could you, I don't know if this is on the mic. The mic is on, yeah. <laughs> I think maybe this idea of having so many computers together is not so good. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right. Uh, I was going to say something, but uh, maybe John wants to expand on this idea of uh, this idea that Plotinus has been uh, explicitly uh -huh. Aristotelized. Uh, Aristotelized. Um, That's okay. I, I meant them as an aside because uh, I can't. I, I don't want to use up airtime for everything. Um, so those are just those are just momentary <laughs> remarks. Um, after uh, whoever else had a question, uh, I may come back uh, and uh, address the uh, so the Aristotelian uh, dilemma. But uh, let's see if anyone else has anything to talk about first. We need to connect to the internet. Just okay. Uh, so. Uh... Let me try and say some, uh, but I'll, I'll try to announce it without spoiling. Um, basically, uh, I disagree with your uh, last, the last part of your paper, and I think you can imagine um, why. Uh, especially, I disagree with the coupling of indexicalism and modern realism. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, the other thing that uh, I didn't cover in the paper is that, uh, well, very briefly in, the, in my response, sorry, in my response uh, this far, I, I might change that, is that uh, at some point uh, you address the idea that uh, you have uh, access to, to uh, direct content through acquaintance. Um, I would resist that as well because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, basically my model is really uh, roughly Kripkean model. So basically the idea is that uh, you don't have to have any kind of acquaintance. You have to have just uh, a kind of indexical or linguistic contact with, uh, with, uh, with whatever, whatever comes to you. Uh, and then uh, as I'll explain in my response uh, on Friday, I don't, I actually, I think there is something uh, that is a bit, a bit uh, badly Put in the in the paper, in the sorry, in the book, because basically in the book I say that there is a that basically propositions. I, I kind of adopt the idea of the rare positions, and actually I think I think you can you can go one step further. So basically, acquaintance with the rare. I have problems with the two terms. Uh, I have problems with acquaintance um, uh, because I think acquaintance, I'm convinced by sellers and others that this is uh, going to end up falling, making us fall in the, uh, in, 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 into the given. Uh, and second, uh, the rare, I don't think uh, the rare is the best way to actually, uh, well, the rare is good as, as far as it is a rejection of the dicto, but I think we should go farther and reject uh, the rare contents as well, because the rare contents are not sufficiently indexical. Um, and uh, I won't say much more than that because then I'll start spoiling my my reply uh, on Friday and trying to preserve that as much as I can. Um, 
So uh, the other thing I wanted to say, and uh, that's going to be very, very brief because John wants to say something, uh, is that this idea that um, is to do with this idea of beyond being. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I think Levinas appeals to the idea of infinite and uh, his notion of, of, of infinite is definitely not Cantorian. It's actually hard to understand. There's actually a Cartesian notion of, of infinity. And uh, it works uh, as, uh, as that, because uh, in a sense, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, it sort of eludes um, cognition. So the, illu the illusion of cognition here is, uh, can also give us a hint that is interesting for me of what would mean violence in a, in a, in a, in a sphere that's uh, in a domain that is not quite the human only domain, the anthropic domain. And my answer to this is that uh, uh, basically it is, it is cognition in the sense of trying to uh, replace the other with a substantive description, right? A description in terms of substantives. So this is uh, th this is kind of gives us a, a, a the idea that infinite is what, in a sense, for for him and uh, I can I can I can buy into that. Uh, infinite is what uh, eludes systematically any kind of Find description uh, as in a sense, if you have in Mexico, in the to things like other or or the great outdoors or outside, in a sense, if Levinas is somehow right, uh, if he has any right to appeal to this Cartesian infinity, then in a sense, you are already uh, going beyond what can be represented. So in a sense, uh, there is a tension here be between representation and, uh, and indexicals, if you want, or in particular the indexical order. And, uh, and then this is what I think he tries to capture with the idea of infinity. As for going beyond being, I think this is, uh, this is, very, uh, this is very interesting. I think going beyond being is for him a, a way to escape uh, basically from myself and from sameness. So um, the question for him, and I think this is something I was, uh, we were talking, I was talking with uh, Carlos and Sofia the other day, uh, I think is a primary concern of uh, Levinas that he tried to do in different times of his life in different ways. Uh, but he wants to ask the question of whether it is impossible, whether it is possible at all to get out of myself and of uh, sameness. Uh, so that's, uh, for him, this is getting out of, of, of being. And in fact, getting out of being is, uh, uh, is getting out of this kind of uh, my own capacity to act, my own agency, my own agenda is breaking with all that and breaking with all that, not because I'm free to break, it's breaking with all that because if I'm free to break, then in a sense I'm not actually breaking with it because I'm actually doing what my being is uh, kind of uh, making me do. So in a sense, uh, to get out of this is to get out through some kind of uh, passivity that requires freedom, and this is why I think uh, the paradox already, already looms and. Uh, I, I, I will say uh, more about this uh, later, uh, but, uh, but basically this idea of uh, sort of consequence of my freedom is crucial uh, because, because then uh, you can sort of envisage a way of going beyond being and going beyond being means uh, going beyond that track that makes me uh, follow my sovereignty, my spontaneity. Uh, but on the other hand, that interruption that comes from outside, that comes from the other, is an interruption that is only possible within the exercise of my freedom. So this is why, you know, this is why uh, there is, uh, th there are many 
many things that uh, maybe need to 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 be unpacked here. Uh, and uh, I I'm just going to announce this, and then I'm going to develop it later as the, uh, as I'm developing my responses. Uh, basically, I believe that there is a uh, there is a connection between the paradoxical metaphysics that uh, I'm uh, kind of um, recommending, the indexicalist one, and uh, the paradox that is very dear for Levinas, which is the paradox of freedom, which is the paradox that uh, can be stated very quickly like this. Uh, I am free, but through my freedom, I discover my responsibility. And because I, am, I have this responsibility, I'm no longer free. So in a sense, uh, that, uh, that paradox has to me, and this is maybe not surprising for Paul, uh, uh, a structure that uh, is similar to the uh, paradox that uh, we diagnose when we talk about uh, redactalist uh, paradoxical metaphysics. But uh, anyways, uh, uh, I'll give the floor to John. Please, if anyone has uh, anything, uh, please go first. I can always bring up a lot of the stuff in my talk. Okay. I have, I have things to say, but I'll say them later, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm really glad that Paul's paper uh, has put on the table so clearly the paradoxicalist side of the book, right? Uh, we have both an indexicalist thesis and a paradoxicalist thesis and a claim that the one implies the other, uh, which I think is probably true, but more of that later. Um, so, let me uh, just give a brief uh, formal indication and then fill it out with uh, Aristotle. So uh, this is part of the permanent different between Paul and myself, but uh, uh, here's one way of formulating it. An absolute totality is inconsistent. There are two ways of taking that, I think. The surface grammar invites us to read it as an absolute totality existential commitment is inconsistent metalogical predicate. That makes it sound like in order to predicate inconsistency, you first have to assert the existence of that which is inconsistent. There's of course another reading, which at first sounds epistemological rather than ontological, although I'll argue that it isn't, uh, namely just if, we take there to be an absolute totality, we derive an inconsistency. Therefore, there isn't one. I agree with Paul that uh, given Aristotle's background assumptions in this Protrepticus argument, um, he is uh, probably never going to admit this, but he's compelled to read it the first way. He just doesn't see uh, that it implies inconsistency. But perhaps so much the worse for Aristotle, uh, the existential commitment there, given the background presuppositions seems to be, if you're going to inquire into X, you're existentially committed to X. But that's highly questionable and it's, uh, particularly questionable uh, given the role of reductio in Platonic dialectic. And uh, again, one way of crystallizing the difference is to ask whether double reductio, uh, as I think uh, Paul rightly puts uh, the paradoxicalism, whether double reductio, uh, which follows from the Aristotelian position is reductio plus or reductio minus. Um, I think pushing Aristotle to the point of uh, paradoxicality um, invites us to think that double reductio is reductio plus. 
uh, whereas the platonic position and, and more later about why it might be preferable um, invites us to think that it's actually reductio minus, that it's taking a step back when it thinks uh, that it's taking a step forward. Um, and to be much too sweeping about it, um, I think that's probably why Heidegger, uh, with whom, as you know, Levinas is always uh, engaged in a critical relationship, um, why Heidegger starts with Aristotle and I think stays with Aristotle rather than Plato. So that's kind of a lot, but uh, the most important point there is the one about existential presupposition. Okay, I mean, let me just say something very partial and not at all sufficient um, to that. I mean, I think part of my thought was with respect to the use of reductio on both sides. I don't know whether it's the first thing <laughs> you said or it's, the, or it's the second thing, right, really. But, but in the antinomies, right, um, we get exactly a thesis and an, and an antithesis, both of which um, themselves are, are apagogic or, you know, have... Uh, a contradictory structure of argument um, behind them. Um, and in the antithesis, we get exactly the claim of, of non-totality, that there is um, that there is no totality, right? Um, so if we want to take the reductio to be a really a double reductio, it struck me that we have to reject both, right? So we have to reject both um, there is a totality and also there is no totality. Um, and so, I mean, I. I would hope there not to be really, and not to be at least on the side of reductio plus, if that would mean invoking some kind of super existent beyond that contradiction, but rather really on the side more of what we were, as, as was brought up in Carlos and Sophia's paper, really subtractive um, to, you know, to, to um, get us to a position where we can subtract ourselves from that, from that reasoning. Um, I don't know, maybe that's not really response. Um, let me just say with respect to is, is Elon gone or I'm not sure. I'm not sure who's still with us. Am I it seems like they might have accomplished some traction for the moment. Right. <laughs> well anybody else sir? I think we're supposed to go till 20 past the hour with with mine. Um, um, I suppose pending connection, I could just declare a, a break until <laughs> 20 past the hour. I, I can go one more short round. Uh, okay, sure. I, I think maybe you inadvertently said something tautological. If we want to go the route of double reductio, then we have to accept, uh, th then we have to reject both sides. Um, yeah. Well, yes, clearly, but uh, but why should we want to go the route of double reductio to begin with? And uh, of course, you, you do address that. Um, it's just that local formulation that I think is potentially seductive. But I just, I, you know, all I wanted to kind of add there um, is maybe in a way it's tautological, but but I wanted to kind of make it motivated. Um, and this is something that I'm not at all sure about, so I would you know, welcome push back on it, but like I wanted to motivate it from an indexicalist position um, itself. So in other words, starting, and this is something I think that is actually marked, I, I believe in, in Kant's um, discussion of the antinomies um, where he uses the term given um, and he means by that a given by something broadly present. He doesn't mean given in the sense of the myth of the given or something like that, but he means something broadly, you know, just, just present. Um, and all the, the, both sides, the thesis and the antithesis really start with a given. Um, and, and I think that that's not been well understood um, in general, but I think that what would be interesting if it would work would be to motivate both sides of the antinomy, both sides of the reductio completely on indexicalist grounds without ever appealing to something like a kind of view from nowhere or, or overview. 
I don't know how successful that is, but. I think, Elon, can you hear me or? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ah. No, you can. My, my. We've we've been having some trouble with the internet. We're very sorry for this, but uh, let's see. Try anyway. But did you see it? Uh, did you, did it, did you carry on? It didn't fall for you, did it? <laughs> we we did a bit. Um. Uh. Just I I I was we were we were pursuing the I, with John we were pursuing the double reductio. And it's, All right. and it's a... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, and it's still live on YouTube, so I think it's uh, it should be it should be fine. Uh, okay. Um, may I may I just say something then to? Um, yeah. I... Uh, okay. Um, and we can of course return to this when we talk on on Friday again. Um, but um, with respect to the so so smaller smaller point um, and um, um, again we can talk more about it um, in, in uh, later. But um, acquaintance um, I think for Lewis doesn't mean uh, what acquaintance means for Russell or or something like that. And in particular, I think it doesn't mean something that would imply would in, entangle him in the myth of the in the myth of the given. Um, I think what he means by it is actually just a um, some kind of well he specifies it as, as typically a causal relationship to um, to something um, through which uh, the, 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 the the thought is that that relationship being in that causal um, relationship of covariance with something allows me to uh, think of that thing under a, a privileged kind of description what he calls a description which is a description which is an acquaintance description something something like that. Um, so that's, I mean, and that's that's just kind of shorthand for the thought. I take it that we have a distinctive kind of thought about things that is um, about those things as as particulars um, that isn't reducible to an objectively third person description. Um, so, in other, when he calls it a description by acquaintance, he means actually by, by what he what he means by description is actually sustaining that causal relationship. Um, to the thing, right? So I don't think that if there's worries about, uh, and I think you have you have further worries for sure, but about about um, this um, this uh, uh, defense of of Lewis's indexical, what I think what I claim is Lewis's indexicalism. Um, but um, I think it's not that worry, um, the myth of the given worry, that, that is really the problematic here. Oh, and also, and you know, I think also with respect to the Kripkean thing, um, I take it that that Lewis could well agree, and this is where he says it doesn't have to be a relationship of acquaintance, it could be a relationship to, or a knowledge of the essence um, of the thing, that the kind of um, case in, that Kripke is interested in, where I point to a thing and I say that thing, or, you know, I point to a guy and I say that guy could have lost the, the election, right, that indexicalist kind of kind of reference um, is sufficient uh, to get the kind of de re thing that he that he's interested in, in going. So I don't think there's any real disagreement with with Kripke um, on on that right it, it depends on so I mean even for Lewis will call it a, a, a way of having access to the object under a description but by description he means just a, a relation a causal relationship oh it, it comes to the same I think it comes to the same the same thing well uh, I think uh, well that that last bit I wouldn't quite agree because I think you know descriptivism in a sense, comes out of the, this is something that uh, I, I wrote in my response to you today. Uh, descriptivism um, in, what, I mean, maybe he, maybe he uses description in a, in a non-standard way, but I believe this is rooted, I mean, the, the, the way he goes is rooted in this idea that uh, you, you, you would have troubles if you had, if you had the possibility of, uh, of a transworld identity. Uh, and I think this is a misunderstanding of Kripke that Kripke already pointed out uh, uh, 
pointed somehow towards in in the in, in meaning and necessity when he says uh, possible world is not uh, is not a different planet or is not uh, another country that you can spot in a telescope, uh, and that's why you know transworld identity is not uh, is not the is not the issue uh, because it, it it it's just straightforward. For instance, if I am in another world, I am in, in well, it's from me that I can that I conceive uh, the the other possible world. So in a sense, I mean, already spoiling that part of my response on Friday, but then I can skip it or, or you know, maybe change it. Uh, basically, what, uh, what I think is that uh, any bit of indexicalism from the part of, of Lewis comes already too late because, uh, because, of, because of his uh, concretism, or because of his modern realism. So, um, so th that's, my, that's my kind of misgiving. That's my worries with... Uh, coupling uh, Lewis's uh, modern realism or 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 concrete uh, account of of possible worlds with uh, indexicalism, uh, my worry is that uh, it comes too late. Uh, whereas uh, Kripke's take, which is uh, for one thing uh, very different from Leibniz's account of possible world, in that sense, Lewis is closer to Leibniz because Leibniz also doesn't allow for, for transworld identity. Um, then in a sense, uh, Kripke's view, I think is more suitable to, a, to an indexicalist uh, account. But this is something interesting to discuss. And I think, uh, I'm sorry we're having so many problems. I couldn't, he I couldn't hear almost anything about your discussion about, uh, about uh, uh, with, with, with John because we started having problems. I don't know. I, I don't understand quite why we're still online and things seem to be all right for you because here nothing seems to, to be working quite. But I can see, I don't know, if I say something about that, it would be very nice. But then we can move to, to, to the next talk. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'll just say something really brief and then we can, then we can move on and we can talk more later. But um, yeah, no, I think, I think the problem of, of kind of trans world identities, which is not, not one that I wanted to go into, um, you know, in this paper, but, um, but it, it certainly is, is the right place to, to, to question or to, to, to push here. Um, I mean, I think, but to me, that's more, I think, I think that there are problems on both sides of this, of this dispute um, or debate. I mean, I think um, it's right. I mean, I think there is, there is, um, a question about from what perspective can Lewis, uh, who does who who doesn't, I mean, he has counterparts rather than than trans world individuals. Um, so, you know, from what perspective can he address the counterpart relations in general? I think that's a real a real problem and a real question. It was what I was trying to kind of get at in part at the very end of the at the very end of the talk. Um, but I would argue that Kripke is no better, um, and Kripke's Kripke's framework, which requires you know maybe isn't. It doesn't have this kind of like modal telescope view that that um, that um, you know Kripke complains about at the beginning of of, of um, naming a necessity, um, but nevertheless it requires that when I rigidly designate something, I pick out the same thing in all the possible worlds in which it exists, right? So it requires that reference to the to the other possible worlds, and you know he's skeptical about the kind of concreteness of them, sure, um, but the thought that and Lewis argues against you know, against this in other places, like the thought that we could kind of just stipulate the trans world identities is equally empty, um, I think, to, to Lewis's picture. So I would just want to say that trans world identities are just a huge problem for anyone, right? Um, but I think that that's equally uh, a problem for, for both sides of that of that particular um, dispute. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. But I think uh, if you... Uh, um, Fully, I mean, I would bet, even though we have to think this through a little, a little further. I think uh, I would bet that uh, uh, some of these problems, at least, uh, is if you embrace a thorough indexicalist account here. And uh, I agree that Kripke doesn't. Uh, and uh, in a sense, Kripke doesn't. I think Perry, sorry, Kaplan does one better. And uh, but, but also Kaplan has has limits as well. So in a sense, uh, yeah, I think I, I think it's an issue. But uh, uh, but yes, but I think uh, you have to the idea that uh, transworld identity starts with uh, an indexical move 
of the sense of pointing at something, which means like basically fixing a reference. I think that's uh, that's a starting point, uh, a starting point that's, uh, uh, that that you have no equivalent in counterpart theory. But anyways, I think this is um, yeah. Um, so um, should, should, should we move on? Um, how is the connection for you? Every, everyone is can can hear me decently. Wow. Yes. Yeah, we're good. It's all amazing. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for your time. Uh, yeah, oh, that's very good. Okay, so we, we move on to, to Jason. Um, and uh, meanwhile, try to sort out my computer that is absolutely non responsive at the moment. Okay, so Jason, thanks. Oh, thank you, Ilan. Thank you for you, your invitation and for the opportunity to be here with you, with you all discussing this wonderful book. Um, thanks also uh, to you, Paul, to Carlos, Sophie for the this excellent presentation. Unfortunately, I don't speak English very well. Uh, in fact, very little. Uh, furthermore, I have so many, uh, many inhibitions when I try to speak English. Um, I'm sorry, and in fact, in the original planning, Ilan, uh, I would speak tomorrow, but unfortunately, tomorrow I, I will be uh, participating in another uh, event. So I, I would like to apologize to my, to my dear English-speaking friends, uh, for I'm going to speak in Portuguese. I'm sorry. You can take a break, and and then don't worry. You you won't miss you won't miss anything. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, Ilan. Um, bem para para mim o o livro do Ilan indexicalismo é um dos livros mais interessantes e instigantes que eu li nos últimos tempos. É, estou envolvido com outras coisas, muitas vezes não tão filosóficas, e, e realmente foi um, está sendo um, uma experiência muito interessante é, ler o seu livro. Eu lamento que não tenha acompanhado um pouco uh, de perto os seus, seus trabalhos, eu acho que já lá por volta de 2018 você já estava trabalhando, né? pelo menos pelo que eu me lembro, 2018 você já estava trabalhando nessa nessa direção, já antes, né? com excesso de sessões, mas, é, enfim, é, se ela vir, né? É, eu confesso que ainda não pude concluir a leitura do livro, é, depois dessas discussões que vocês tiveram aí agora, eu me sinto até um pouco mais ainda inibido também em português agora, não sou, uh, não, eu sou um leitor meio lento, né? E, e, e o grande problema, eu acredito, tem a ver com o fato de que eu não, não possuo muita familiaridade com a maioria dos autores que correntes de pensamento discutidos. Eu conversei com isso, Ilan, com você, eu acho. É, eu, eu não conheço praticamente nada de Whitehead, é, muito pouco de Levinas, é, Uh, tenho até medo de falar alguma coisa de Levinas perto de você, a Lafetá, a Gabriela estará também aí presente amanhã, uh, vocês conhecem muito bem uh, Deleuze, uh, Viveiros de Castro, por exemplo, eu conheço pouca coisa, alguma coisa ainda uh, leio, mas não tenho conhecimento profundo, Há autores, inclusive, que eu nem conhecia, como Severino, eu cheguei a comentar com você, Ilan, é, cheguei até a já encomendar o livro dele, é, que me parece ser muito interessante. E, é, além disso, toda a minha formação ele passou passou meio que ao largo da, da, da filosofia analítica e isso fez com que, com que a minha formação fosse, vamos dizer, muito orientada numa direção. Não é? É, e, e, por fim, o meu contato com o realismo especulativo, é, embora seja, como, como está escrito no livro, um, 
um movimento filosófico, eu concordo, para nossos tempos, mas também foi muito superficial, ou seja, eu estou realmente, como para usar uma expressão que está no livro, aí uma expressão importante do livro, eu estou realmente é, do lado de fora, né, no, 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 no Great Outdoor, né? e não só isso, eu estou totalmente perdido e desorientado, não é? Mas é, o, o que eu acho interessante, eu até estava comentando com o Ruben é, hoje pela manhã, né? o Ruben, o meu filho, é que o livro me fascina muito. Né? E é interessante como, como uma coisa pode fasciná-lo é, sem que você compreenda direito o que está acontecendo. Né? É, o que acontece? Esse é um fenômeno interessante. É, eu vou tirar o fone do ouvido, porque agora passei a me ouvir, eu estou ouvindo um eco muito grande. Eu vou tirar aqui um pouco o fone. Se vocês quiserem me interromper, me interrompam. Bem, como eu ia dizer, é um, é, um, é um fenômeno muito perigoso isso daí, é, tipo, é algo como uma situação limite hermenêutica, eu vou falar um pouquinho de situação limite, mas aqui eu me encontro numa situação limite hermenêutica, é, dando frequentemente com a cabeça na parede, Leio uma frase, uma outra. Alguns momentos eu entendo lá quando falam um pouco de Heidegger, de Rosenzweig, ou, ou talvez de alguns autores com, com que eu já trabalhei. E, e você vai construindo, né? Uma, você vai tentando imaginar o que está sendo dito e tentando estabelecer é, é, referências com algo que já nos é familiar. Né? Em meu caso, é, em diversos momentos muito espontaneamente, eu estou colocando todas as cartas na, 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 na mesa, ou seja, todas as minhas dificuldades é sobre isso que eu quero falar, na verdade. É, em diversos momentos da leitura, me veio à mente alguns aspectos do pensamento de Kali Aspas. Não, acredito, Kali Aspas. Né? É, principalmente aqueles expostos uh, por Kali Aspas no no terceiro volume da sua filosofia, intitulado Metafísica, é interessante. Às vezes, um, um livro que, que influenciou bastante gente, entre eles, por exemplo, Paulo Ricoeur, que escreveu uma grande, um grande trabalho sobre ele. E também, na sua lógica, uh, tem um livro de, de aspas, intitulado Lógica sobre a Verdade, em que ele fala do, daquele, do, do abrangente, o, das Ingreifen, né? É, mas, mas talvez mais interessante ainda, e hoje, agora, ouvindo o debate também, eu creio que aquele livro que está entre a filosofia e a psicologia, um livro que é difícil de classificar, é a Psicologia das Visões de Mundo, é a Psicologia Weltanschauung, é um livro que, que me parece que contém vários elementos, pelo menos contém vários, vários uh, uh, termos, conceitos, que são apresentados aí nesse desse trabalho do, do, do Ilan. É, eu fiquei até surpreso, porque essa relação eu já estava fazendo, depois eu havia pulado o prefácio, e, eu, pelo, escrito pelo Harman, e, e quando eu li no prefácio, ele faz, faz lá uma menção rápida do, do Calhaspas e das situações limite, é, pensando mais na questão da morte. Né? Mas, enfim, é, eu acho que há, há alguma coisa interessante aí. Eu não sei se eu estou... Eu concordo que, que o que eu estou falando pode estar totalmente fora. Não fora no sentido do Great Outdoor, mas fora da, da, do escopo em que nós estamos agora é, discutindo. Mas é, a minha proposta, e eu estou trabalhando nessa direção, talvez talvez tentar estabelecer essa essa relação seja interessante. Né? É, eu até pensei em mudar o, meu, o título da minha palestra de não falar uh, 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 como que é o título da minha palestra mesmo ou outro outro e aspas sei como que é ah é what would e aspas say about indexicalism eu até iria mudar para what would uh, Ilan say about e aspas né uh, seria talvez talvez um jeito interessante de de tratar a questão uma vez que uh, com um livro, com um trabalho de Ilan, ou seja, o trabalho de Ilan está me abrindo algumas perspectivas para certas leituras e para compreender certas, certos movimentos é, no pensamento não só de Caliaspas, mas de outros autores. E até pensei, 
é, esses dias é, que o trabalho poderia servir até para é, assim, um trabalho muito interessante para ver em outras áreas, por exemplo, na, 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 na literatura, no, na, 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 na antropologia, sem dúvida nenhuma, na sociologia. É, é um trabalho que talvez abra os nossos olhos para certas certos problemas e certas certos fenômenos muito interessantes. Né? Mas eu eu queria falar então eu queria talvez falar rapidamente sobre cinco pontos é, e que me chamam no momento a atenção. Há muitas anotações que estão aqui. Eu tentei destacar algumas delas. A primeira, a primeira tem a ver com o ponto de partida é, é do Ilan. Acho que essa filosofia, essa é uma palavra que aparece muito, é uma é, situated, né? é uma filosofia situada. A filosofia indexicalista é uma filosofia situada, está sempre associada a uma situação, a várias passagens do livro. Talvez a palavra situated é uma das palavras que mais aparece no livro, é o que me chamou a atenção. Né? E o que significa situação aí? Nós vamos nos perguntar isso daqui a pouco. É, não vamos ter resposta, mas quem sabe o Dan possa nos, nos ajudar nesse ponto também. São essas palavras que são aparentemente, é, é, como se diz, é, óbvias, né? é, cujo significado nós jamais questionamos, né? são às vezes palavras complicadas. Né? O que, que seria situação? Mas, enfim, é, para mim, a, 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 essa filosofia está situada é, naquilo que é, poderíamos chamar, o que o Ilan mesmo chama, mais para o final do livro, de niilismo. Né? Eu estava lendo o livro e, e sempre estava tentando imaginar em que situação, né? qual é a situação, eu vou usar uma palavra que pode ser mal entendida aqui, mas... É, faz parte do meu vocabulário filosófico, eu a uso é, com frequência, é uma palavra usada por Heidegger e por Karl Jaspers também, por Sartre. Qual que é a situação é, fundamental né? em que brota esse livro? né E isso me parece que aparece apenas no final, no final do capítulo, no final do livro, no capítulo 3, onde onde Vida começa a falar um pouco de nihilismo e me parece que lá a palavra a ideia de nihilismo está bastante vinculada também a uma concepção que Heidegger tinha de nihilismo, do nihilismo, né? O pensamento nihilista, nihilista caracterizado por aquele esforço de ter é, tudo sob controle, né? O mundo torna-se um, para usar uma expressão que o que o Ilan é, usa em seus vídeos sobre esse assunto, que eu recomendo, aliás, são dez vídeos muito bem feitos e muito interessantes, o mundo torna-se, ele diz, um repositório de coisas que estão à disposição, né? de coisas de coisas que podem ser, que estão aí, diante de nós, podem ser medidas, manipuladas, apropriadas, dominadas, violentadas, controladas, da maneira que se quer. Né? É, Lembro-me da de uma frase que o meu professor, uma expressão que o meu professor sempre gostava de dizer, o meu professor que foi meu orientador de doutorado, muito tempo atrás, ele dizia assim, é, ele citava sempre Galileu, né? e depois Max Planck, que falava, não, Galileu dizia, é, tem -se que medir o que é mensurável, o que não é mensurável, tem que se tornar mensurável. E Max Planck, no século XX, vem e fala, é real, a realidade é apenas aquilo que é mensurável. Isso é uma, uma expressão interessante, né? Isso parece refletir um pouco, uh, já para o meu orientador, uh, era uma, um statement praticamente do nihilismo, né? Era do nihilismo é, falando. Né? E nesse contexto poderíamos também, uh, eu creio, inserir a, a ideia da, de metafísica. A metafísica, pelo menos a metafísica tradicional, a metafísica da presença, como como Heidegger é, aponta, a ideia de que a realidade é transparente. Né? Esse é um ponto é, que me chamou também bastante bastante atenção. Né? É, tudo 
tudo é tudo tem que se tornar transparente. E o indexicalismo, proposto por você, Ilan, parece-me que, acho que já tinha falado isso, mas agora falo para vocês os que estão nos ouvindo, é né? interessante a, 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 a propósito dessa aí, esse, até, até hoje tem um problema com isso, né? porque eu estou aqui numa sala fechada, pedi para todo mundo ficar quietinho aqui, e fico falando aqui com o computador, com, no caso comigo mesmo, né? às vezes, e... É, vendo as, as, as faces, é, por vezes as faces dos meus colegas, mas é, ainda tenho que me acostumar com isso, né? é uma situação meio complicada. Né? Mas, é, como, como eu disse, é, para não sair do assunto, o, o indexicalismo proposto por você me parece oferecer é, um antídoto contra, contra isso que que nós chamamos de nihilismo, né? que você mesmo também chama de nihilismo, né? essa convicção que a realidade é, de certo modo, é de certo modo transparente, né? a ilusão de que temos uma, uma chance de conhecer as coisas, de conhecer os outros, em sua totalidade. Mesmo que saibamos que teremos dificuldades para isso, mas parece que esse é um impulso né? de que há ah, essa, essa totalidade. Né? É, basta nós é, é, aprimorarmos é, a, nossas, a nossa capacidade, é, desenvolver a nossa capacidade de conhecer. É, ou seja, o indexicalismo, como eu vejo, que é apontar para um pensamento que tenta escapar desse nilismo e rejeita de maneira decidida a, a transparência. Né? Isso está logo no início do, do livro, fica claro, né? É, no determinado momento, agora não sei se é no livro ou, na, ou, na, ou nos seus vídeos, a, é, você fala de uma virada do pensamento metafísico, né? usando essa palavra aqui. É, se usa, o Heidegger mesmo utilizou da, da Kiri, né? uma virada do pensamento metafísico. É, embora essa virada, isso é interessante, não é, isso para mim não me fica claro no livro, né? estou traduzindo o livro agora com as palavras do, 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 do Gerson Breyer, né? Uh, mas essa virada não é um, um dar as costas, vamos dizer assim. Né? O nilismo é algo que está aí, que perpassa totalmente nossas nossas vidas, tudo. É, e não é algo que se pode ignorar. né? É, daí ele, é, foi de, é por isso que eu pensei em titular a minha participação, ou seja, o título inicial da minha participação, uh, além daquela pergunta sobre o que Aspas diria sobre isso tudo, é, tem uma expressão, né, in the face of failure, ou seja, foi uma tentativa de é, traduzir a express, uma expressão diante do fracasso. Né? É, então, é diante do fracasso porque o nihilismo sempre está aí como um fantasma. Né? Isso vale também é, para, eu creio, né, esse, essa ideia de fracasso também vale para o para o paradoxo né, existente nos esforços de desenvolver uma metafísica dos outros, uma uma metafísica paradoxal, né, é, que é uma metafísica consciente da impossibilidade da metafísica. Isso não, nos remota, me remota, né, nos remota, me remota também aquilo que Aspas faz no, no livro dele, Metafísica, né, que é um livro extremamente é, difícil, exatamente porque... É, e aspas, vai lá apresentar a ideia de cifras da transcendência, uma coisa meio, meio estranha a princípio, né? mas que, que, que também é, que se recusa a, a, a desenvolver uma, uma metafísica que apreenda, é, que, que enquadre, vamos dizer assim, o todo. É, bem, então, nesse primeiro momento, então, nesse ponto 1, um, esse seria o ponto de partida, o nihilismo, que eu acho que até poderia estar já no início do livro, é, é, mas isso é uma, uma questão de escolha, porque nós aí teríamos ideia do porquê dessa, de, de, desse empreendimento, né? do porquê desse indexicalismo. Né? É... O segundo ponto, eu acho que é, tem a ver exatamente com situações limite. Né? A situação limite é um, algo que também 
é, me parece que está presente no livro, né? e aspas é um conceito fundamental na filosofia de aspas, como vocês sabem, grandes situações, é, limits situation, é, há, há outros que traduzem para o boundary situations, ou seja, é, a ideia aí de Grenz é interessante, em 1919, quando ele está usando e desenvolvendo essa ideia, é uma época que também se estavam demarcando as fronteiras, ou seja, Grenz aqui na Europa, né? por exemplo, e, e, e ele traz esse conceito, traz essa ideia para o seu livro, né? uma, uma ideia central, como Heidegger mesmo reconhecerá em vários discursos que Heidegger vai dar nessa época, ele aponta para esse para essa ideia de grande situação em aspas e mesmo 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 depois é, ele vê aí uma abertura é, interessante para se pensar a, para se é, pensar essa ontologia fundamental que ele propõe né? é, mesmo é, mas essa ideia já está interessante em aspas é, na verdade um psiquiatra né ele não estudou né? Eu não fiz nem graduação em filosofia, né? Talvez por isso que seja difícil entender, né? Às vezes, mas é, 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 foi um, um filósofo que influenciou muita gente, né? Pedro influenciou pensadores como Merleau-Ponty, Ricoeur, como eu disse, mas influenciou também Marcuse, influenciou Sartre, influenciou Deleuze, né? É, Merleau-Ponty e, e outros, né? Já, na, já nessa sua psiquiatria, no seu livro de psiquiatria, sua é, psicopatologia geral é, parece que já as, as situações limites já estão lá. Né? Quando ele fala logo nas primeiras linhas, você abre o livro, você lê as primeiras linhas, do primeiro parágrafo, ele, ele começa a apontar para os limites da compreensão experienciado pelo psiquiatra que se encontra diante do seu paciente. Né? E, e dizendo, ele diz, olha, o que está aí é algo que é totalmente, é algo que nunca você vai apreender. Né? É algo que, que, que simplesmente foge. É, você, você não é, você ou seja é, é algo é, é, in, é, indefinido né? é, por, por e que, e que e que desafia constantemente a, o, o psiquiatra né que nessa relação médico paciente tá tem que dar uma resposta né a, a situação é interessante porque o livro, aliás, eu gosto muito dessa primeira edição, principalmente, de 1913, porque nele é um livro diferente dos outros livros de psicopatologia que tentam elencar, elencar ou discutir diversos fenômenos, fenômenos psíquicos e, e patológicos e assim por diante, mas é, nesse livro parece que as pessoas estão mais preocupadas em, em, em trazer... É, problemas para o psiquiatra, ou seja, ele quer deixar o psiquiatra inseguro, né? ele quer deixar, ele quer deixar, tirar o, o, o psiquiatra de, daquele, daquele, da, daquele seu espaço de segurança, vamos dizer assim, né? e por isso que ele também traz a ideia de fenomenologia logo no início, né? que ele acredita, pelo menos o Russo não vai questionar isso, mas ele, ele acredita que a, a fenomenologia poderia ajudar a o psiquiatra a ter essa consciência. Mas, enfim, esse é um assunto que já foge muito ao, ao escopo do livro. Mas o, o que seriam essas situações limites? Né? E, e, é, talvez só precisar mais um pouco para ver como que eu acho que ela está de alguma maneira presente, ou, ou talvez eu esteja, como, como eu disse, eu reconheço a minha, a minha limitação, então pode ser que eu esteja totalmente é, errado, né? mas... É, é, as situações limites são termos que aspas usa para designar aquelas situações que que são não somente por assim dizer incontornáveis momentos de crise que às vezes passamos mas sim como são situações nas quais por vezes me deparo ou seja teríamos que talvez aí fazer uma distinção entre situações limites e experiência a experiência das situações limites são talvez duas coisas distintas, distintas, mas são situações na, 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 nas quais eu me deparo com nada, com, com, com um, ou nada, vamos dizer assim, se, uh, se podemos usar esse, esse jeito, né? os quais eu não consigo imaginar ou, 
conhecer nada. Eu não consigo ter mais horizonte algum. Eu, eu peguei aqui uma situação, eu, deixa eu ver aqui, eu, são situações, eu, me permitam só uh, essa citação do, do livro de aspas, mas pensando também em, em algumas passagens do, do, do seu trabalho, né? não são situações em que não há nada sólido, nenhum absoluto, indubitável, né? a propósito, sempre na cisão sujeito objeto e crise, né? sempre na cisão você, a citação completa, né? situações em que, nas quais, sempre na cisão sujeito objeto, no mundo objetivo concreto, não há nada sólido, nenhum absoluto indubitável, nenhum apoio que oferecesse firmeza, estabilidade a cada experiência, a cada pensamento, tudo flui, está no constante movimento de ser colocado em questão tudo é relativo, finito, cindido em contradições, nunca o todo, o absoluto e essencial. Essas situações limites, como tais, são insuportáveis para a vida e assim quase nunca se apresentam. Olha, elas se apresentam em toda a sua clareza, a nossa experiência viva. Na prática, quase sempre possuímos um apoio dentro das situações limites. Sem esse apoio, a vida, a vida cessaria. Isso está lá na psicologia dos dos de mundo, uma tentativa de as pessoas definem um pouco essas situações limite, né? Eu, ou seja, aqui né, se experiencia, eu tenho um problema com essa palavra experienciar, eu não sei o que, que acontece aí, mas aí se revela, se, se experiencia o um fracasso, né? um, um, um fracasso total. Né? A cognição fracassa, a imaginação fracassa, a especulação fracassa. E esse é um fracasso público, é provocado por algo que se apresenta. Eu diria de algo que vem, aliás, com aspas, eu diria, de algo que vem de fora. É, então, o fracasso é, é, um, é um ponto central nisso. Né? Não é à toa que Marcuse, em 1932, eu acho, eu estou colocando as datas simplesmente para a gente ver onde que momento esses filósofos estão refletindo sobre isso. É, Marcuse ele percebeu bem isso. Ele, ele escreveu um, um ótimo ensaio sobre aspas, intitulado, aliás, sobre aspas, e comparando com Heidegger, um pouco, né, ele vem dessa tradição mais heideggeriana, é, intitulado Filosofia do Fracasso. E eu sinto, de fato, que essa diversos momentos do livro pode ser uma percepção falsa, uma percepção errada minha, mas eu percebo que em diversos momentos desse livro essa ideia de grande situação está presente, né? essa ideia de situações de é, Inclusive, né, no, no, no momento em que Aliás, essa ideia de situações de limite já começou, lógico, no começo, você vê um pouco isso, mas naquela discussão de, dos conceitos de suprimento, excesso e horizonte, que são ideias que eu quero aprofundar mais, é, por isso que até já é, encomendei alguns livros aí, né, para poder entender isso, porque eu não tenho essas, essas leituras é, que inspiraram o Milan a, a usar, a, a, a se apropriar desses, dessas, desses conceitos para poder é, desenvolver a sua ideia indexicalista. Né? É, mas eu percebo aí, como eu dizendo, já muito essa, alguns momentos é, da, dessa, dessa situação limite. Né? Ou até mesmo quando se fala de great outdoor, né? é, talvez, e aspas, é, né? diria, olha, nas situações limite você experiencia não só o great outdoor, né? não, mas o é, greatest outdoor, algo do tipo. Né? É o é o fora total, né? o, o, o maior fora, o greatest out of the world. Então, essa é uma, uma reflexão segunda, depois do limite, nas situações limites. Ah, mas a questão principal, e esse, é, isso é uma, 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 um momento, um, um movimento interessante do pensamento de aspas, mas eu acho que também esse movimento está aí, é... E aí que surge para mim o indexicalismo e esse realismo, a metafísica dos outros. É, o que fazer diante dessas situações limite? Né? O, o que fazer diante desse greatest outdoor? 
é, o que fazer quando, é, é, quando realizamos, né, realize, que não há que não há nenhum apoio. A palavra apoio também é uma palavra muito interessante, muito usada na, na psicologia das visões de mundo. Né? E, 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 por, e é muito interessante observar como o Heidegger vai usar também muito essa palavra. Né? Uh, halt, né? uma palavra tão pequenininha né? uh, em alemão, e se a, pode ser traduzida por apoio. Aparece muito em Heidegger, se vocês quiserem uma hora dar uma olhada, justamente naquele texto, ou naquele, né, naquela, naquela sua conferência, que depois foi publicada, chamada uh, e titulada O que é Metafísica? Né? Em vários momentos de Heidegger, mas lá aparece de uma maneira bem marcante. Aliás, também é, naquele texto ele se confronta com o niilismo. Né? É, então, o que fazer quando nós realizamos, né, ou percebemos que não há nenhum apoio? Embora essas palavras realizar, perceber, experienciar, esse, esse, esse é um, um, um conjunto de palavras que causa muito problemas. Eu não sei direito, às vezes, o que aspas está querendo dizer com isso. O que é isso? Né? O que é esse? Cai a ficha. Né? Talvez cair a ficha fosse uma boa palavra. Né? Cai a ficha. E é interessante se cair a ficha, porque eu não faço nada. De repente, pum. Né? O que acontece quando nos confrontamos com um totalmente inesperado? mais ou menos isso que ele está falando, com a, com a impossibilidade de, da totalidade, de uma totalidade, ou seja, como podemos chamar isso. E as pessoas mostram que a tendência, a tendência é, é fugirmos dela, né? É, ou seja, a, em outras palavras, a, usando um pouco as palavras de Dachau, nós tem a tendência, nós tentar, a, a tendência é construir um abrigo, ou seja, a gente tenta é, construir uma carcaça, um gerroise, como disse, aspas, uma palavra também interessante, em que possamos ter o sentimento de segurança, de proteção. Afinal, as, as situações limites, elas escancaram é, nossa condição humana, né? nos confrontam com nossa existência, com apontam para a indefinibilidade e compreensibilidade das coisas, é, do mundo e, e de nós mesmos. Né? Ou seja, elas ameaçam. Na verdade, elas ameaçam destruir tudo. Né? E da proposta indexicalista do Ilan, eu, é, eu, eu vejo isso também. Né? Ou seja, a tentativa de pensar uma metafísica né? paradoxal, claro, porque é, senão ela ia se tornar um guerrói, né? como as inúmeras propostas metafísicas que nós temos na história da filosofia. É, então, ele se esforça para pensar o um indexicalismo como uma filosofia, é, para usar uma expressão, é, que escapa dessa visão do drone, que tenta constantemente evitar que, que os, os, as deites, né? os, os deíticos, tornem-se substantivos. Né? É... Ou seja, é um, é um esforço contínuo isso, né? que pelo menos pelo que eu tenho entendido até agora do, do texto dele. É... E aspas, talvez num quarto momento, né? é... talvez uma palavra que 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 é muito importante também no livro do Milan, que foi discutido agora aqui, tá, se discutiu muito sobre infinitude, é, mas uma pegada um pouco diferente da que eu teria, talvez pela minha limitação, né? mas a palavra transcendência é né, uma palavra fundamental e, e para aspas, a transcendência é aquilo que é, é o termo que ele usa exatamente para tentar é, denominar aquilo que, que que experienciamos nessa situação limite, esse nada, assim, né? esse, essa, essa abertura total, esse esse infinito, como ele diz. Aliás, foi uma discussão bem é, interessante sobre o infinito, mas com é, eu não entendi muitas coisas aí, é, mas é, e aspas também, talvez uma tradução mais do romantismo alemão, essa palavra, não sei. É, 
Mas ele fala de uma transcendência que não possui conteúdo, assim como também não é uma coisa, alguma, uma, é algo que se apresenta. Ou seja, é um nome para isso que se apresenta fora, é, esse, esse totalmente outro, né? e que ameaça a minha, a minha, a minha situação atual. Né? É, eu, não, é, eu posso tentar imaginá-la, pensá-la, formulá-la, é, mas ela sempre escapa de alguma maneira. A tendência é essa. Né? Então, tudo isso faz parte também daquele movimento do, que eu chamei, o que Asco chama de Guerróis, né? de de um casulo, né, daquele que nos protege, né? Porque isso é ameaçador, porque eu não tenho é, nada, eu não, é, ela, ela não é, num certo sentido, né? é, essa, não é uma coisa. É, e quando o Iascos até, até insiste nisso, né? Ele fala que quando, quando nós tentamos então é, etiquetá-la, quando nós tentamos então é, substantivá-la, né? é, quando pensamos que sabemos o que é transcendência, que se sabe o que é transcendência, ela deixa de ser transcendência. Ela perde seu caráter de infinitude. Ó. E esse movimento é muito importante também. Pra... Eu percebo, pelo menos, esse esse, esse, esse esse movimento também no, no, no indexicalismo do, proposto pelo Ilan, a palavra transcendência também aparece, é, é vinculada a Levinas, como nós vimos na, na discussão anterior, nas exposições anteriores, na exposição do Paulo, por exemplo, né, onde ele fala bastante disso. É, quem sabe, talvez, a, a Gabriela possa nos por um pouco mais o que seria a transcendência para iluminar e o que seria essa transcendência também é, dentro do trabalho do, do Ilan, né? Ou seja, ele diz logo no início lá é, que the transcendence is relative to a position in precisely what escapes speculation. Né? Ele está fazendo uma crítica também, até a própria especulação, isso é uma interessante, isso também se, se encaixa com as coisas. Ele fala que nem, nem, nem a especulação, é, a, a transcendência escapa a isso. E eu vivencio isso justamente nas situações limites. Esse, por isso que é tão importante isso. Né? Porque não é através de argumentação, lendo um livro, etc, 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 etc. É algo que se dá, né? é algo que é um evento, vamos dizer assim, é um árduo. E, 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 e que me parece não, 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 não ocorre sem a nossa a nossa a contribuição a contribuição da nossa parte o esforço da nossa parte é, de outro de outro lado a obra filosófica dele e eu vejo o indexicalismo eu estou lendo o indexicalismo porque ele está também mexendo bastante comigo como eu vi numa mensagem ontem do Manuel se o Manuel estiver nos ouvindo um grande abraço eu tive a oportunidade de ver ele uma vez, né, conversar com ele, uma pessoa espetacular. É, é, é algo que, 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 que nos pergunta, né? O que você tem pensado, o que você tem feito, né? Como você tem é, levado a sua vida. Então, é, eu, talvez esteja tendo uma... Eu sei, eu sei, talvez não, eu, eu sei que é, essa, essa interpretação minha é extremamente existencial, vamos dizer assim, né? mas eu acho que é possível uma leitura também existencial disso, né? desse, desse texto, desse, dessa proposta que o Ilan nos faz, né? que nos apresenta. É, então, e essas propõe que o que fazer é uma, é uma mudança de é uma atitude, né? Uma, nós temos que mudar, é uma questão de ele chama de Einstein, né? ou, ou, ou de Halt, ou de busca pelo um Halt, por um apoio mas é, né, um, é, um, é um determinado posicionamento né? e, e a filosofia dele vai ser sempre uma discussão em torno disso, né? um apelo é, a, a discussão a, a, por isso que talvez Iasco seja um autor difícil de ler às vezes porque sempre a, a sua obra tem esse caráter apelativo, né? como Hatch, Diz, Arendt, vários outros pensadores que vivenciaram Walter Benjamin né? que Iasco tinha tem sempre esse, essa coisa de, de de, de fazer uma, um apelo para que uh, nós uh, 
comecemos a pensar, né? E ele fala aqui que, então, esse apoio, tá, que era um apoio, então, esse apoio é um apoio no infinito, né? que é uma, uma uma expressão que eu gosto muito, porque eu acho ela interessante, porque como que eu vou me apoiar no infinito? Ah, então, quer dizer, que, que, é, quando, como, quando a gente vai se apoiar, a gente tem que apoiar em algo né? que oferece um pouco de segurança, né? que, que tem né? que, que é um, alguma proteção, alguma ajuda, né? que tem alguma estabilidade. Né? Mas esse apoio no infinito é exatamente a tentativa de é, pensar, não só de pensar, de viver, de, de, de é, existir sem, sem essa segurança, né? sem essa proteção, é, tentando manter exatamente é, aberto para aquilo que vem, para aquilo que vem de fora. Tá? E, e é assim também que eu vejo um pouco o indexicalismo do Ilan, né? pelo menos, é, talvez, é, como disse, esteja fazendo uma leitura por demais existencial, até talvez um pouco ética, vamos dizer assim, no sentido de da busca pelo pelo bem viver, ou pelo, pelo, pelo bem no sentido mais grego da palavra, né? pelo pelo como eu posso viver e e também como é, ou seja como uma possibilidade de refletir e de dialogar também com a tradição e com os outros porque não né? em algum momento me parece que eu, agora eu acho que foi no, no, num dos vídeos que eu, em que me trata disso ele fala de, de, de que essa metafísica é uma metafísica eu, que dialoga eu acho como, que tem um caráter de comunicação. E, de fato, isso vai ser, para aspas, fundamental, né? porque se você, está, se você não está disposto a apoiar-se em algo que lhe ofereça segurança, se você não está indisposto, né? se você decide, se você se posiciona de uma maneira que... É, de, que de, de, de tal maneira que você esteja aberto para aquilo que vem de fora, né? é, é, fica muito difícil né? você é, viver sempre diante desse fracasso. Né? É, e, e por isso que aspas, é, e, e, e por isso que surge a ideia do, do filosofar, e aspas, e a ideia também de, 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 desse diálogo com a tradição, de, desse, dessa ideia de comunicação depois, mais para frente, de uma maneira mais contundente, e aspas vai tentar mostrar, não, por isso que eu preciso muito também do outro, de, de me abrir de, dessa abertura de, de, da comunicação. Né? Eu preciso conversar com o outro. Né? Então, é, e algo disso também está presente aí né? na, na obra, do, de, na, nessa, né? nessa proposta que o Ilan é, nos traz. Né? Bem, é, é, eu sei que é, que tudo isso pode ter soado um pouco estranho né? numa, numa roda de pessoas e ouvintes que, que já estão mais familiarizados com, com, com o assunto, mas é isso mais ou menos que haveria as outras coisas, mas quem sabe o, o Ilan me perdoe pela, é, ou compreenda a minha incapacidade e a gente bate um papo um dia sobre outros problemas ou que eu tenho. Tá? É, muito obrigado a vocês aí por, pela paciência, é, aqueles que, e por ter podido falar isso tudo em português, porque vocês percebem eu estou tão confuso e expressar minha confusão em inglês seria seria totalmente difícil, seria muito difícil, né? Então, obrigado a vocês todos. Tá? Well, thanks. Uh, I don't know if you should uh, carry any English or in, or in Portuguese. It's up to you. But um, maybe I should try to summarize a little bit of uh, of what uh, just uh, brought um, to the discussion. I mean, he was. Um, um, 
the limit situation that uh, that the great outdoors uh, provokes and uh, in doing that he was of course comparing um, dexcalism with with jaspers i don't know jaspers very much i think uh, uh, most of what i know i know through through him yeah through 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 jason so in a sense but i think what is uh, uh, an interesting idea that i think is is very relevant is this idea of tra of a transcendence without content. So the transcendent here is contentless. Uh, and that means in particular that, uh, I mean, that there are many ways of understanding this contentlessness, but the indexicalist way of understanding this contentlessness is the uh, idea that uh, it's uh, basically two things. First, uh, it's not composed of a substantive that is high up there, um, uh, and second, it's not composed. It's not a. Uh, it's not a presence. It's not something that is fully present. It's something that. Uh, so therefore, is 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 uh, is not a content in the sense that is, that that, that can is is it, it doesn't make itself present. It's, is it doesn't present itself completely. So. Therefore, in a sense, it is a limit to where your uh, a metaphysic could go. Um, now, uh, one thing that sort of I like uh, using the book that illust to illustrate, uh, like to use to illustrate the, the very endeavor that I was after, which is, uh, of course, in a sense, to uh, um, broaden the 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 perspective uh, that Levinas um, inaugurated, and I think broadening it's uh, it's it's a bit unfair to the to the project in a sense, or not unfair, but in a sense uh, we're doing uh, the idea is to do more than just to 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 broaden it, and this is something that uh, I think uh, I do. I do mention in my responses, but uh, not exactly in the in my response to to, to Poe. And uh, I think is a is a is a wonderful insight he has in his paper. That's as far as I realize, as I remember, realized I was uh, it was a very deaf, very difficult session today here. I don't think he mentioned in the he mentioned he does mention the paper doesn't mention his presentation is the idea that. Uh, if Levinas um, concentrates on the other human, then in a sense, uh, he ends up doing something that uh, on his book, on his standards, uh, is something that he always wanted to avoid, which is um, um, resort to a neutral uh, element. And the human is a neutral element, it has to be a neutral element between me and the other. And, uh, and I think this is uh, this is a wonderful way of putting something that uh, that has been around, has been set haunting me for a while. And I saw, for instance, uh, um, um, two days ago to um, Steve uh, uh, Butler, Judith Butler. And her um, giving account of oneself when she addresses uh, that I know, yeah, uh, in her um, in her sort of uh, uh, work, uh, she starts sort of um, she complains about the the use of the idea of face because basically her point is that you one has to recognize a face as a face in order to be moved by a face. Right, and uh, therefore is um, something like um, uh, face is a cognition that doesn't require recognition, which would amount to some kind of uh, well, let, let's put it uh, in a in the ways uh, in the way of our discussion before uh, an acquaintance in the bad sense, an acquaintance in the resilient sense, you make it some kind of uh, some kind of uh, variation of the idea of. Uh, of a given without uh, without concepts, uh, because if it was a concept, then in a sense you'd have to have cognition, 
in order to recognize a face. So then in a sense, the whole thing would depend on knowledge or, or freedom, which are very similar for, 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 for living us. Uh, I think Butler's idea is very, is very much to the point uh, but the way of phrasing, I mean, her gesture, I think it's right. I mean, her, the, the, the problem that she sees is, 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 is very, um, is very, it's quite on the spot, but the way she phrases it is not so good because uh, I think basically Levinas has this, has this way out that uh, is uh, very similar to what I did uh, with respect to acquaintance. Uh, when when I was uh, trying to respond, Poe basically Levinas could say, "Well, it's not about uh, it's not about me recognizing as a face, but uh, to to use uh, uh, the vocabulary that Poe was using, uh, basically, it's just like the face striking me. Uh, uh, so basically, the face strikes me. It's not it doesn't it doesn't need for the face to actually be recognized as such in order to strike me." So, uh, so in a sense, Butler's point is interesting. It's like, I think, moving in the right direction, but not really. Whereas I think Paul's point is, is, is precise. It's basically saying human, if you put to a face, right? If you say, uh, because basically, because I don't see my face. So in a sense, you can say a face is something that the others have. I don't have a face. And I think Levinas would be very close, either argue for that or being very close to say that. But, um, but when, when you say, when you talk about uh, uh, human, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's the basically. Then, in a sense, the right way to make the move that Levinas wants to make is to extend this to other to any other, yeah. Uh, and then, and and this is where I think this um, kind of imagery, uh, let's put it this way, that uh, that uh, the Jason brings through uh, Jaspers becomes very interesting because this is then is. It's kind of something that transcends, but something that transcends without uh, without having a content. That means without needing to uh, be recognized to, to, to get back to, to Butler's terms, uh, um, and without and, and without presenting itself as uh, uh, as something fully fully there to be uh, unveiled, to be unconcealed. Uh, so in a sense, um, the great outdoors, let's put it this way, or the other, yeah? Uh, and I realized uh, about the great outdoor as a, as a unity, uh, then there is this uh, idea of monotheism already looming, looming about, but uh, mm. I think still we can, I can escape uh, from that, but anyways, when we talk about the great outdoors, that thing that uh, doesn't that that transcends, but doesn't transcend because is a uh, because of its content, then I think it's I think indexicalism becomes um, appears to uh, appears in a very interesting way. So basically, uh, the idea is that is there is no transcending substantive. And I think uh, that's one way of, 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 of putting it, I think maybe uh, a little away from the book, a little, a, little, a little far from the book, but there is a, there is a transcending very special in Dexico because uh, the other is outside and at the same time is accessible because of my um, capacity to uh, uh, locate myself in an inside that has an outside, in a sameness that has an otherness. So, um, so I think that's uh, that's uh, that's very um, that's very interesting. Uh, basically, a transcendence without uh, transcendence without content is the kind of transcendence. So, basically, the idea is that uh, I, I think we would say, as far as you don't have indexicals then there is no transcendence. The transcendence appears when there, is in the, when there are indexicals. So we live in a world 
obstacles. Uh, that means we are we live in a world where transcendence is everywhere. But then to say that transcendence is everywhere is very dangerous, and we're already like being in the in the in the, in the dangerous zone for for, for paradox. Uh, I was not going to go uh, again into paradox because I believe we're going to go uh, into paradox many times in other sessions. But I was going to just finish by saying something that uh, that I think illustrates very well um, the the purpose of the whole exercise. Uh, and it is in the book. It is the beginning of of chapter two. Uh, it's this idea of uh, of this injunction of uh, of Anat Singh, according to which. Uh, you are to do two things. First, to uh, tell the world with the best of your knowledge, produce a narrative, and that's very important. We, we have to do it. Uh, and this is uh, something that I had to say for to, to Carlos and Sophia. It's not that you uh, abstain yourself from doing it, but at the same time, leave within your narrative space on the ground for other accounts. And that's... Uh, that, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't want to stress the paradoxical element of this because I think, in a sense, is is obvious. But uh, I just want to 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 to, to use this to uh, as a way to clarify the kind of paradox I have uh, that indexicalism is committed to. So, in a sense, it is uh, the idea that um, uh, we do we do identify other narratives or other accounts, right, as other, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, our narrative will encompass the other narratives that are within ours. So that doesn't mean, and, and that has to do, Jason was stressing this business of, um, uh, of uh, you know, nihilism and uh, the whole Heideggerian story that, uh, that, uh, that, that he was uh, talking about. And then basically I think that's, that's the point. I mean, the thing is like a, a, a narrative or a discourse or an account is not uh, to use a word Heidegger uses in the, in the, in the Bremen lecture, uh, Bremen lectures, which are the ones I use, uh, I think quite, I use most in the, in the book, if I remember right. Uh, so it's uh, it's a thesis, right? A thesis, right? Uh, and then he opposes thesis to thesis, yeah. But basically, the opposition between. So here you have a thesis, but a thesis doesn't become uh, the only way for a thesis not to become a gestell if for it is for it to be open, and open not uh, in the sense of having an outside, having a great outdoors uh, uh, is opening in the sense of. Um, hosting this great outdoors inside it, right? So one thing, one last thing I want to say, because, uh, you know, then uh, we can we can talk, uh, is that uh, lately uh, I've been formulating this, this is after the book, formulating this in a way that uh, I think, uh, I think is interesting to in this discussion. Uh, which is the is if you have a thesis or if you have a narrative that uh, that explore to the infinite Hello. Yeah, I think I, I crashed You're again. Back. I think we have to go somewhere else. <laughs> we lost you for a minute. We have to go somewhere else. We'll go, we'll go somewhere else for the second section. Sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I was just going to finish what I was saying. 
Uh, so basically, if you have a, a narrative, right, that uh, doesn't give any space for other narratives, and then you assume a very tolerant attitude, say it's just one account among, among many others, your tolerance or your open, it, it is not in a sense inside the thesis that you're, that you're putting forward. So in a sense, you're already doing a thesis that uh, is to say it very, very, very quickly and using the image that uh, Jason was, was bringing, uh, it's already something that is going towards or heading towards uh, uh, Gestell, yeah? So, um, so yeah, so that's, that, that's just my, my quick response to, 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 to Jason in the sense of saying, yeah, it is a, it is, it is a very interesting and promising uh, comparison. I could just um, mention, like, say one quick thing. Um, yeah, I mean, the um, the point about the human, uh, which I think, and the, the fact that thought that when I, if with Levinas, I, I address what is really another human, that is something with a face, or I'm addressed by that, that I'm addressing it in a kind of common medium, which is just what Levinas doesn't want. That's not my, that's, that's Derrida. I really got that from Derrida. So that's really like, you know, Derrida and violence and metaphysics. So I just wanted to not claim credit for, um, for, for, for that thought. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. And I think this, and I think this, um, you know, somehow this thinking of the in in violence. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, somehow this this thinking of the um, indexical as the, as as it were the the being of transcendence without without content. Um, I think that's really interesting and and just yeah, really promising. And I'd like to if I you know wanted to kind of contribute anything in part, it was just to kind of like try to think the logic of that, or, or you know, kind of to try to try to think the logic of that of that structure. And also what, hopefully what you said at the end about also needing to host uh, or needing to, to take in inside that which is, that which is indexically there or indicated as, as transcendent without, without being present, yeah. I, I again had had problems understanding, uh, hearing what you're saying because uh, it keeps in here. Anyways, so I don't know if. Um, if, uh, if it just, um, just so that's a uh, platform to do a bad action. Well, Jason, se você quiser falar alguma coisa para a gente terminar a sessão, porque tem que correr para para ver se eu. No, no, no. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, uh, was very nice to, to, to participate with you. And sorry that I can't uh, do that uh, in English. And, but I, I write my paper in English <laughs> and you can communicate it. Okay, sorry, Alexander, Paul, John, Janina, Ilan, huh? 
A conexão está ruim. Obrigado, né? Gerson. Obrigado, obrigado Alexandre. Oh. É, Ilan, a conexão está ruim, cara. Está difícil de entender você. Yeah, so we're going to try and go to a cafe um, and uh, and hopefully uh, it's going to be better in the next session. So okay. thank you very much, everyone. So I'll quickly close everything now so that we go see you um, in uh, about half an hour, um, hopefully.